Chapter One of The Complete Bachelor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Complete Bachelor by Oliver Onions. Episode One Sugar and Lemon. Perhaps Rollo said, My sister, Caroline Butterfield Spinster you would like to go on to your club and call for me in an hour or so there will only be women i expect carrie i replied your consideration does you credit but no company that you may enter is too bad for me i insist on accompanying you it is my first duty as a brother carrie laughed i believe you like it rawl she said molly chatterton says loring says you never go to a club if you can have tea with a married woman it is the one reward of a blameless reputation i replied but that loring chatterton should say so is rank ingratitude considering his own ante-nuptial record rank ingratitude we dismounted together at millicent dixon's door and were admitted to the hall carrie gave my necktie an attentive little tug slapped my cheek carrie is justly proud of her middle-aged brother and likes to show him off to advantage and preceded me into milly dixon's drawing-room some half-dozen ladies were engaged in the usual five o'clock flirtation with tea and cake and contributing to the feminine hum which didn't subside in the least as we entered he would come milly said caroline after a crossover kiss on both cheeks but you can lean him up in a corner and give him some tea to keep him quiet this from my own flesh and blood milly dixon gave me a laughing nod over her shoulder and busied herself preparing the cup that should have the effect carrie suggested i sat down and composed myself to listen to the restful chatter that was supposed not to interest me mrs loring chatterton at my side was rippling gently on the subject of a school of art needlework exhibition while carrie and mrs carmichael talked marshall and snedgrove to cicely vickers and mrs julian joyce i have no disdain for ladies babble it is quite as entertaining as starting price and stock exchange gossip and much prettier but i couldn't get chatterton's remark out of my mind cream or lemon mr butterfield called miss dixon from the other side of the room yes if you please i answered absently while miss dixon looked a deprecating query as to when i should be sensible i roused and turned to mrs loring chatterton where is loring to-day i asked oh i don't know she replied i told him i shouldn't want him this afternoon so he said he would count the dreary hours till joy returned i expect he went to count them at some club loring always was ardent i remarked looking meditatively into my cup i seem to remember that kind of thing from loring before long before you knew him mrs chatterton what do you mean mr butterfield nothing my dear mrs chatterton i replied nothing out of the way but you don't suppose that loring had the good fortune to happen on the perfect gem without what shall i say a uh, preliminary prospecting mrs chatterton and i are old friends she laughed do you think you can make me inquisitive mr butterfield i know all about that why i made loring tell me every it was my turn to laugh then there is nothing more to say i answered loring is my friend he has claims upon me he has doubtless given himself quite away and half his bachelor friends into the bargain i think i see him doing it isn't that a pretty gown carrie is wearing i chose it for her loring told me a good deal said mrs chatterton musingly the buttons are from her grandmother's wedding gown and he was so clumsy and boyish she continued words were superfluous i smiled anyway mrs loring went on i don't think it fair men have half a dozen flirtations before they are married their wives know nothing about and women mrs chatterton i asked some women mr butterfield may not be scrupulous but the unfinished sentence was a resume of female virtue since the days of penelope what are you two interested in cried mrs carmichael from a remote sofa i had just caught her eye 
mrs loring placed her hand beseechingly on my sleeve but i hardened my heart oh we were recalling the time mrs kit i replied before your several husbands were enticed from the liberty of bachelor life we were commenting on the change in them you should be able to appreciate the difference mr butterfield returned mrs carmichael you are just where they left you years and years ago yes ma'am i replied i have not been able to bury my memory in the wedding service nor forget my past in a honeymoon i am still as unregenerate as say um, kit carmichael was before he met you you are a great deal worse returned mrs kit you refuse a very pretty compliment mrs carmichael i replied yes at kit's expense it was you who made kit as bad as he was he told me so the perfidy of these married friends rawl butterfield you have no use for them when they sacrifice you on their nuptial altars their eyes lost their singleness with their hearts and your reputation has gone for a kiss well you have your revenge on their wives if you care to use it the spark of righteous war was kindled within me i leaned forward and spoke my speech with icy distinctness so i am responsible for carmichael's past am i mrs kit listen to me there was not a more abandoned and desperately wicked trio in london than kit carmichael your meek brother miss dixon and loring mrs chatterton endeavoured to stop me with a hot teaspoon laid on my hand but i still testified and loring chatterton not content with steeping their own souls in infamy they must needs go afield and corrupt the spotless name of one oh carrie carrie what your poor brother has suffered and now to be told in his old uh, his middle age that he did it all mrs kit and cicely vickers had put their heads together and were endeavouring to put aside the damning testimony in mock admiration of the dramatic skills with which it was uttered cicely vickers had best be very careful i was to be leaned up in a corner and given tea was i doesn't mr butterfield look well with the light behind him said mrs vickers with a pretty gesture of her hand mrs vickers paints flowers and asks her friends what they would really like for wedding presents mr butterfield may have the light behind him mrs vickers i replied but he has no regrets for a misspent youth charlie vickers wasted his youth most shamefully mornings in the park with a young lady in a pink frock is that not so mrs loring i turned to her suddenly it was a green frock said mrs loring thoughtlessly then turned quite pink it was a pretty situation loring might have treasured that blush i was avenged millicent dixon came to the rescue carrie dear she said you are the only one who has any influence over that irrepressible man do gag him for a few minutes and passed over a plate of gaufrets which carrie brought to me i held the plate to mrs loring chatterton who a reminiscence of fun still in her eyes accepted the peace offering with a warning shake of her head mr butterfield she said you never were anything but mischievous and it's my opinion you never will be oh i wish i could get you off my hands there are plenty of nice girls look at milly there she whispered mrs loring i replied once upon a time there was a fox who was caught in a trap and had his tail cut off after that ah well i suppose you know your own mind but mr butterfield she leaned over and spoke quite low i believe you make out your young days and loring's to have been much worse than they were do you not now mrs loring had a little beauty spot on her conscience which she thought was a stain end of episode one episode two of the complete bachelor by oliver onions this librivox recording is in the public domain episode two a hypothetical case carrie and i were placidly surveying from either end of my little dining-table the creditable wreck we had made of a rather neat little dinner 
carrie never disdains this hour of the animal at whatever table fortune shall place her and when she does me the honour to dine with me she generally pays me the compliment of evident enjoyment it is a feature i admire in her i was making leisurely coffee arrangement with my latest bachelor acquisition a pretty little silver and spirit affair that did not necessitate rising from a comfortable seat while my sister purred in soft content i moved the shaded lamp aside to see her better carrie is a very presentable young woman i thought her arms decidedly pretty i think rawl she said as i looked carefully to the coffee i think we will not grace the theatre this evening it's such a wet night and i'm so comfy here i could hear the rain without getting up it was a wet night and she did look comfy very well my dear sister i replied as you please it will save me a sovereign unless you succeed in coaxing it out of me during the evening which i have no doubt is your real motive no rawl really i don't want not enough eh? Huh? haven't got it my dear this is good coffee caroline i'm really as poor as hooli there that's right cumul avec n'est-ce pas my dear please no rawl we'll sit here and be nice all the evening i'll bring my writing in may i i was only half convinced it wasn't money she was after something carrie's writing is her one affectation with which exception she is as sane as would be expected of my sister i believe it was a modern comedy which was then occupying the years of her youth and whose production was to be the crown of her old age she worked at it intermittently that is to say when there were no calls to receive or to be made when she could find nobody to take her to the theatre or a garden party when there were no women to gossip with or men to fascinate whenever in short she felt dull but of late she had seemed to recover interest in it had recast it she said bring it in by all means i replied but bring a dictionary as well i'm not absolute in spelling oh, thank you rollo why the deuce was she so uncommonly polite she usually announced that she was going to spend the evening with me in much less considerate terms i shook my head apprehensively when dinner was removed carrie disappeared and presently re-entered with an armful of comedy and a mouthful of quill-pens she made a clean sweep of my desk and settled herself with many quirks and little graces before the recast masterpiece i gravely asked her permission to smoke and she smiling at the superfluity of the question bowed a ceremonious assent then got down to business and chewed a pink knuckle in the stress of composition i put my feet upon a chair lighted a cigar and looked alternatively at the fire and at caroline she made my room appear very comfortable with her evening frock and pretty airs she was an excellent housekeeper and kept my half of our little flat almost as dainty as her own we got along very cosily carrie and i for a sister she behaved very well indeed she could have the sovereign if she wanted it i only hoped it was no worse by and by carrie looked up meditatively started on a fresh knuckle and then turned to me what do men talk about after dinner rawl when the women have left she asked i looked at her curiously and smiled no rollo she said I, I don't mean i mean what do they talk about oh i replied what do they really talk about eh? yes i want to put it in the play you want to put it in the play let me see i considered a moment well after the first grief at the loss of the ladies their hands go instinctively to their hair to feel how they have looked if there is a mirror handy they flock to it then they sit down look wistfully at the empty chairs and fold their hands patiently to await the earliest moment that they may rejoin their bereft partners oh don't be absurd rawl answered carrie i want to know i've got a man here who is to talk after dinner he's in love with the girl he's been sitting next to and i want him to say pretty things about her happy happy innocence dear simple carrie should i be the one to destroy so sweet an illusion never i was intensely amused but i replied thoughtfully 
i should think in the first place it would depend a good deal on the man and the girl what are they like he's a soldier said carrie looking timidly down at her manuscript that is he has not seen any active duty but he's simply thirsting to do some brave deed that shall show her how he loves her yes i said much interested a carpet knight how old he's about four-and-twenty i believe and he's not a carpet knight he's very good and clever and noble he's supposed to be dining at his married sister's and has to entertain the men with brilliant talk if i didn't know that noble young soldier i would never look on daylight again black hair i said yes replied carrie promptly that is i don't know i haven't decided yet i leaned back in my chair to recover from the shock this then was what made her so loving to her brother this was the nice evening we were to have she had a secret which pricked her conscience she was going to be nice to me for the time remaining i might have known she didn't visit mrs loring chatterton for nothing a soldier to run off with my housekeeper she had recast the play with a vengeance i was to play the good brother's part i shut my eyes well raw said she she had evidently not noticed my state she didn't know i knew let me think i replied let me think i was not allowed to think a tap at the door roused me and two visitors were announced in came loring chatterton and the young brother-in-law himself i had to admit he was a not unprepossessing young warrior how do you do miss butterfield came simultaneously from my two guests while carrie rose putting aside her manuscript i greeted them from my chair i am afraid we interrupt your writing miss butterfield said loring sitting down oh no mr chatterton caroline replied as a matter of fact i was rather stuck when you came in yes loring i interposed carrie was rather stuck when you came in perhaps we shall be able to help her huh bassishaw delighted replied bassishaw but i'm afraid do you know that i haven't much of a head on me for that sort of thing miss butterfield rollo began carrie oh he'll do carrie i replied caroline wants to know bassishaw what a young man good clever and let me see was he noble carrie yes i believe he was noble and a brilliant talker i had him there a brilliant talker would say after dinner about the girl he thought he loved carrie was helpless i had not given her away and she did not dare to protest for fear of doing so herself she had a secret i also had a secret i would keep the case strictly hypothetical well miss butterfield began the hero who was thirsting to do some brave deed i'm hanged do you know if i know what he'd say he'd talk a lot of piffle wouldn't he oh but he's a brilliant sort of chap he'd uh oh hang it loring what would he say i don't know i chuckled softly i didn't want to hear loring i wanted to hear the brilliant talker it was for carrie's benefit but if he really loved her i said and his eloquence came out in a torrent oh i see well i expect he'd say she was a confounded nice girl or something pretty and all that you know and he'd row any chap who said she wasn't don't you think hm mm? but why the deuce should he say anything bassishaw was coming out of it with more credit than i thought i laughed and even carrie had to laugh too i think said chatterton that's about as much as he could say unless he were an ass i can't imagine his saying much if you were there rollo no said bassishaw you are a mischievous sort of johnny you know butterfield you're deuced hard on young chaps you guy them awfully you know i expect you've forgotten all that thus unconsciously was bassishaw revenged i was hard on young chaps i had forgotten you know i was an old fossil or something but i had a sister deucedly nice girl pretty and all that you have to keep in with johnnies like that you know one thing i must know did this plain-spoken young man of the sword care for carrie this was soon evident from his conciliatory manner toward me no one ever goes out of the way to consider me unless he wants something bassishaw was most attentive 
by the way butterfield he said after a while are you engaged for tuesday afternoon because if you're not do you know my folks are giving a sort of garden party or something there'll be lots of people of your sort my sort coming clever and all that you know i thought you might care to come i'll get them to ask you if you like and miss butterfield too chatterton here is coming and he'll look after you you know butterfield what do you say i turned to carry i think we might go rawl she said i like to meet clever people i thought a moment i don't know bassie shaw i replied that i care to meet people of er uh, my sort much but if carrie cares to go i'll look after her it may be of use to her in a literary way thank you i wouldn't have missed that garden party for a good deal end of episode two episode three of the complete bachelor by oliver onions this librivox recording is in the public domain episode three a military maneuver i had feigned to change my mind several times with regard to bashishaw's garden party but carrie had suddenly developed accentuated ideas on the subject of engagement keeping we promised you no know, rawl she said it would look so bad to run off i don't suppose it will be much fun she added candidly she was mistaken it would be great fun on the way thither i entertained her blandly on the subject of unmarried life i pointed out to her the advantages of a brother and sister living happily together as say in our own case i argued on the holy bonds of kinship and congratulated her on having a brother who would devote the whole of his life to making her comfortable how happy we were carrie moved uneasily in her seat she endeavoured to change the subject her conscience wrought within her she was a guilty traitor and deceiving the kindest of brothers had she been less in love she might have suspected something as i continued in the same strain but such is not the way of youth her arts might have been transparent to me for months and months yet she would at last break the great secret with most delicious gentleness in stammers and blushes and i would show a dramatic surprise and shock we see other people's progress but our own love affairs are always unguessed it was a great relief to carry when we arrived at the bashishaws the strain was getting embarrassing a straight military young figure had evidently been on the lookout for our conveyance for he made several false starts and almost supplanted the more ceremonious reception due from his mother this little formality through he pounced on us at once how do you do miss butterfield do butterfield he asked warmly so glad you've come thank you i replied i was rather afraid i'd have to let carrie come alone but i managed to arrange it a shade of regret was visible in his eyes but he bore it nicely he is white as carmichael would have said of course he said miss butterfield would have been all right you know but i'm glad you came too i believe he was saying so seemed to make him so we walked up the garden i in the middle carrie received an occasional bow but we didn't know many people there this was young bassishaw's excuse for conducting us personally and he pointed out various people as men you ought to know you know butterfield i betrayed no great desire for the acquaintanceship i was not to be shaken off bassishaw was piloting us into the most frequented parts this young man was manoeuvring with more skill than i had given him credit for to drop me Carrie had my arm, and as Bassishaw stopped at the various groups, I made surer of it by a little closing in of my elbow. He had the advantage of a tactician's knowledge, but I had the larger experience. He led us towards the base of operations, the refreshment tent, where he calculated to play on the natural interest I would take in the commissariat department. He gave me a hint of a private canteen. It was good strategy. I was very thirsty but i held out he showed a great desire to introduce me to personages but i replied to his big guns with the harassing fire of conversational small arms he really did very well and my respect for him increased personal strategy was his line but i held him in the field of mental manoeuvres 
he had pointed out some snowy whiskered old general and had held forth in his redundant way on the fascinating personality of the man i made him a text for an army discourse do you know bassishaw i said i cannot sufficiently admire you military men you are the outposts of a nation who make all that is happy and perfectly at home possible you sacrifice yourselves on inaccessible indian hills you scorch under african suns while all you love is left behind you in england you do not marry that is the true soldier thinks it inconsistent with his duty and you leave all you care for to fight the battles of a less devoted society it is self-sacrificing and when you return it is to a bachelor's old age like the general there oh i don't know butterfield he replied lots of our soldiers marry you know i could feel carrie's arm trembling on mine i continued oh, that is another instance of their nobility it makes their duty all the harder they have to leave their wives and worship them only in the ideal sense they see them perhaps only once in ten years unless they have risen to responsible posts it is a great devotion but rawl said carrie timidly lots of women are glad to go abroad with their husbands and and nurse and that kind of thing then i replied they but unnerve the warrior in the hour of his trial he does not fight for his country but for his wife no it is the bachelor soldier who has my veneration that's all very well you know butterfield protested the bachelor soldier uneasily but confound it it's hard enough without that hang it all he broke out if you've got that fancy sort of thing in your head why didn't you join the army yourself you're a bachelor you know and it would be a jolly lot easier for you to be a hero than the other poor beggars i smiled it is just necessary that the soldiers should have worthy people to defend i replied no bazishaw the soldier's watchword is singleness he is as great a solitary as that other one who devotes his life to writing the soldier knows he is doing some good the writer takes the risk but writers often began bassishaw and soldiers said carrie at the same time both cut themselves off in a voluntary abnegation i replied they scorn the smaller comforts the one worships his art the other his duty look at loring and his wife there they look happy and comfortable and pretty they have gentle domestic pleasures but they have no conception of the grandeur of duty they do not know the stern joys of the warrior they i had been so wrapped in my idea that for the moment my guard was down the watchful foe took instant advantage of it unseen by me he had quietly beckoned to loring who crossed over to us rollo he said my wife wants to speak to you a moment most particularly she is waiting there i was out manoeuvred the ally had taken me in the flank i couldn't resist i looked at them and then at mrs loring who was waiting tapping her toe with her parasol there was no way out i turned away and looking over my shoulder saw the triumphant foe turn the corner of the greenhouse into the shrubbery a road of the third class impassable for artillery now mrs loring i said smarting under my defeat i am glad to see you what do you want oh mr butterfield she returned effusively i've been wanting to speak to you all the afternoon isn't it a lovely day it is a lovely day a lovely day i replied i have been greatly struck by the beauty of the day it is perfect she said endeavouring to gain time oh how nice it is to be young mr butterfield mrs loring i answered severely did you send for me to tell me it was a lovely day and that it was nice to be young oh of course not she replied much embarrassed i wanted uh, i wanted to talk to you i wanted oh do help me loring molly wanted to tell you rollo began chatterton i silenced him with a peremptory wave of the hand molly wanted to tell me something i didn't know i replied molly wanted to tell me that i was blind and deaf and stupid and that i couldn't see what was under my nose she wanted to tell me of afternoon appointments at her house and heaven knows what sort of carrying on she wanted well you shouldn't tease them so replied mrs loring illogical after the manner of women but staunch 
madam i said i am not so fatuous as to suppose that if two young persons intend to practise idolatry on one another my wisdom and experience will stop them but i have been plotted against have been told nothing and i am entitled to get what melancholy amusement i can out of the affair you have spoiled my entertainment i adjusted my hat to an angle suggestive of rectitude and bowed myself away i made for my hostess and had myself presented to the general you have a promising young strategist in our young friend bassishaw i remarked in what way he inquired he has turned the flank of a superior force and is in retreat with a hostage i replied when half an hour afterwards i again encountered the victorious enemy they made straight for me i received them with dignity rollo dear began my sister laying her hand affectionately on my sleeve and coming very close to me we have something to say to you her voice was almost a whisper yes said bassishaw you see it's it's this way butterfield i've asked caroline to be my wife i know it's too bad not to have let you into it but hang it all you don't encourage a chap much you know you're so deucedly quizzy you know and i say butterfield that was all rot about soldiers not marrying now wasn't it i know you're a good chap butterfield and you'll let me have carrie won't you i was afraid he was going to say i should not lose a sister but gain a brother but he didn't my spirit was broken i had no dramatic surprise left in me carrie looked up pleadingly with a tiny little tear in one eye it's yes isn't it butterfield said bassie shaw you're the only one to ask you know and if it isn't yes you know talented young man he knew when to press a yielding foe i sighed and took an arm of each i feebly tried to recover my old authority but they talked laughingly across me and i knew what sort of glances were passed behind my head i was led captive to chatterton and his wife action was better than insight after all end of episode three episode four of the complete bachelor by oliver onions this librivox recording is in the public domain episode four a children's party a good dinner in particular and a comfortable sense of solvency in general had thrown me into a half whimsical half melancholy musing from which i was aroused by a small pair of hands placed over my eyes from behind and a challenge to guess there was not the least possibility of it being any one other than it was but i guessed jack wharton and had my ears boxed jack wharton is a large creature with fat fingers and more rings on each of them than a plantagenet sword has coronets a well-meaning meritorious sort of man and my sister carrie's special aversion carrie sat on the arm of my chair and paid little feminine attentions to my hair which she tried to make the most of there is not so much of it as there once was a certain tendency to early harvest in hair is a family trait and i occasionally subdue the arrogance of my sister's youth by reading to her from the health column of some family paper she patted down the last wisp and addressed me do you know rawl she said i have an idea i leap for joy my dear i replied carrie is used to me she went on unheeding suppose suppose we give a children's party i looked at her in surprise a children's party in my flat what did she mean suppose we give a masked ball or a grandmother's tea i suggested oh well if you will be silly caroline said sitting straight up and adjusting the lace frivolity on her wrists but who on earth are you going to ask to a children's party i asked oh rawl she replied there are lots and lots of children there's alice carmichael's nephew ted ted carmichael is seventeen years old i remarked and nelly bassishaw she continued nelly bassishaw is fifteen and old-fashioned at that i replied well you must have someone to take charge of the children you know rawl but there are heaps and heaps of nice children there's molly chatterton and little chris carmichael and lots of others i do think it would be fun i dare say it would i replied and yourself and young bassishaw would look after them and amuse them i suppose 
yes arthur says he'll come and help she answered i had evidently not been the first one to be considered and arthur will bring half a dozen young bassishaws younger than nelly why yes i expect he will why not and has arthur ordered a magic lantern i asked not yet replied carrie that is he did suggest a magic lantern children like magic lanterns you know rawl i was aware of it other people than children like magic lanterns i leaned back and sighed it was apparently all arranged and what date did you say you had decided on i asked the seventeenth replied my dutiful sister that is if you'll be a good brother and let us have your rooms rawl oh anything you like i replied resignedly i'll clear out to the club and you can do as you please only mind you i added i insist that there shall be children i will not be turned out of my rooms for you and bassishaw and all the nellies and teds of your acquaintance to play any magic lantern racket oh you dear brother cried carrie blowing a kiss down the back of my collar but you mustn't go out rawl we shall want you to help you know you can uh, manage the gas perhaps i suggested oh the magic lantern man will do that she replied laughing you can call the forfeits you used to know a lot of forfeits rawl and pull crackers and things and have sprawling youngsters climbing my back and nurse them when they get cross i thought but it was of no use demurring before a determined young sister i must make the best of it i was given due notice on the sixteenth and cleared my papers away at carrie's suggestion i also took down a print or two children were so quick at noticing things she said then i had the satisfaction of seeing a christmas tree placed in the corner devoted to my armchair and of being able to look forward to a week or two of occasional pine needles and grease spots from toy candles whenever i wanted to read a hairy man also came with a tool bag which he threw on my dining table and proceeded to make what seemed to me a radical alteration in my gas system trailing flexible tubes across the floor over which i scarcely dared to step i took my hat and fled leaving carrie to do as seemed good to her carrie had made me promise to assist and at five o'clock we were at the top of the stairs receiving our young guests arthur bassishaw was there of course he had been about for the last two days and had really carrie said been invaluable every few minutes a nursemaid arrived with some pink-legged fluffy little lump muffled up to its bright eyes young ted carmichael brought my little friend chris who clasped my knees and demanded that i should be a dragon on the spot miss nelly bassishaw came with half a dozen little bassishaws casting a glance at master ted that made that young gentleman nervous about his gloves altogether by six o'clock some twenty small people were sitting round carrie's table with an attendant maid or two tall behind them and the noise was just beginning carrie to do her justice ordered young bassishaw about as if he were her own brother and he assisted with piled-up plates and staggering jellies in the most creditable manner master ted carmichael however was evidently divided in mind as to whether he should consider himself purely a guest or whether his age qualified him for attendance on the kids a perplexity in which his palpable devotion to nelly did not help him much nelly was difficult to woo that evening and was playing off a smaller schoolboy on her half-grown-up admirers in a way that i liked immensely she has the germs of mischief in her and is pretty into the bargain ted therefore moved in a state of unrest now helping and ministering to young needs and now resuming his seat helplessly there was a speck of something in my memory that made me feel for ted the noise increased and by the time master chris a most depraved child had thrust a handful of raisin stalks and broken biscuits down the neck of the lady of five whom he had taken in children were romping here and there regardless of whispering nurses who reminded them they were still at table they were swept into another room by carrie with stamping of sturdy legs and pulling of crackers ted tried to remain behind to be near his disdainful lady but i brought him along i was willing to help him i engaged master ted in conversation the children i said would soon be playing games and then we men would have a few minutes to ourselves 
perhaps time for a cigar he stiffened up in pleased pride and the front of his first dress suit expanded he was grown up then he ventured the remark that kids were awful slow but they had to be amused he expected slow do you think ted i asked why i find them most interesting look at miss nelly there she had just come in she looks almost grown up but any one can see she's the biggest child of the lot look at her with little molly chatterton she thinks she's got a doll ah ted girls like that are at a very awkward age they are awkward ted admitted but nelly you know nelly's not so very she was fifteen last she's almost oh hang it let's get out for a smoke we made for the balcony have a cigarette mr butterfield said ted proffering a small silver case thanks i replied i think i'll have a cigar won't you have one of these they're very mild ted looked doubtfully at it and shook his head uh, no thanks he said i don't often smoke cigars i'm very fond of a pipe now and then after breakfast you know but cigars are a little too much for me light he held me a light and puffed elegantly at his cigarette then continued thoughtfully the worst of women is he said they seem to grow up so awfully quick you know why nelly bassishaw there you know we used to be rather flames when we were young a year or two since that is we're not so very old yet you know mr butterfield he added with a slightly conscious laugh call me butterfield i said softly and encouragingly i don't mind saying he continued i was awfully stuck a while back i used to walk around the house at nights you know darn silly of course and she used to drop me notes from her bedroom window of course you won't say a word to any of the men but at one time she wanted me to elope indeed i said you surprise me in that case i have greatly misjudged her she is not so young as i thought she was no she's not really butterfield he said eagerly she's awfully clever and grown up and all that that is she was when we were so thick some time ago you know i nodded i didn't want to interrupt him and she's going to have her hair up next birthday he went on and then she'll be quite grown up i'm a bit sorry it's all off he threw down the end of his cigarette and looked round at the balcony window no i said it isn't time for the magic lantern yet half an hour or so and you're almost sorry it's all off well yes in some ways he replied of course i get about more than she does you know men do see more life than girls don't they butterfield i went to a dance the other week and of course nelly can't go to dances yet but the men were another set you know and the women well it's not much fun sitting out in a conservatory with strange women is it i reserved my opinion on the point and he went on he got very confidential and by the time he had got through another cigarette he had my views as to whether it was possible to keep a surreptitious wife at eton whither he was to return shortly i rather took to master ted and decided that carrie and bassishaw should not have all the fun out of the magic lantern i would willingly have prolonged the talk but ted was glancing nervously at the window and thought we really should go in the youngsters would need looking after we went in in time to catch them playing some game with a closed door and a piece of mistletoe i saw no necessity for carrie and arthur bassishaw joining in but join in they did while miss nelly looked intelligently patronizing ted was right women did grow up quickly as i took a seat beside her i heard ted whisper to carrie that her brother was a brick i hope you are having a good time nelly i said nelly tossed her curls of course real dances are more in your line i continued but you can spare an evening for the children now and then nelly bit her lip she felt the point keenly i don't go to dances mr butterfield she said stiffly no i inquired blandly well some people are prejudiced against dancing but i see no wrong in it myself do you regard dancing as frivolous she had to make the humiliating confession i don't know anything about it replied nelly turning halfway i am not allowed to go to dances dear me i said motives of health doubtless no i'm not considered old enough 
oh i said in the tone of one who feels he has pushed his inquiries too far that is a pity there is such fun at dances sitting out you know and such things you can't have such fun anywhere else nelly looked a defiant couldn't she though and i considered my young friend ted's affair as good as arranged i heard her whisper to bassishaw later that mr butterfield was a beast carrie came bustling up to ask me to help in the preparations for the magic lantern and shortly afterwards the light was down and the great white circle shifting and quivering on the sheet to the whispering anticipation of eager children when a few minutes later i had taken chris carmichael on my knee and the pictures had begun certain quiet indications from the back told me that master ted was having a good time i couldn't see the young monkeys at it but i divined from the brooding peace in that direction that they were hand in hand hand in hand at least an hour later the place was quiet once more and only carrie bassishaw and myself were left gathered round the cold magic lantern i looked at it and shook my head i had to do it three times before they noticed me what is it now rawl said carrie sixteen next birthday i said to myself what are you talking about used to drop him notes from her bedroom window i mused oh do shake him arthur arthur shook me i looked severely at them both i suppose you know what you've done i said you and your magic lantern they commenced a look of innocence but i quelled them if there is an elopement at your house shortly bassie shaw i said you can thank this children's party don't pretend you didn't see them i'm afraid butterfield do you know that they are mischievous young beggars replied bassie shaw but it's not our fault not your fault i said with rather a touch of scorn i think in my voice not your fault you bring overcharged adolescents together you know the moral laxity of sixteen you know the latent depravity of female sixteen especially you provide them with a handy magic lantern and every convenience and it's not your fault well i did my best to dissuade you you have only yourselves to thank i wash my hands of all consequences don't blame me it pleased me to throw the responsibility on someone else End of episode four. Episode five of the Complete Bachelor by Oliver Onions. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Episode five: The Ideal in Peril. The Paniant Club was going to the devil, which was unnecessary considering the state of the weather. There was nobody about, including Wentworth Boyle the magazines were uncut cutting meant energy the tape machine ticked out nothing but cricket scores in which i am not interested a waiter was sleeping in a chair in a remote corner the only suggestion of coolness about the place there was absolutely nothing to do it was too hot to swear i went to the window and looked out piccadilly was a glaring sahara the rows of horses across the way were limp as chewed string and lived for nothing but the next water cart that should pass and drench their burning hawks the trees bore spiritlessly their burden of dust and the only energetic thing in sight was an impervious newsboy crying the fatalities of the heat wave a song of degrees i was in a fermenting state of discontent the season had only just begun and there were at least six weeks of this to look forward to six weeks of hot breathless theatres and daily martyrdom on the row the season was confounded rot i had half a mind to throw the whole thing up i went to the writing-table wrote a complaint to the committee on the iced drinks murmured the prayer for rain and returned to the window why did the women look so cool when the men were in such a state of collapse millicent dixon had just driven past looking as fresh as a buttercup i saw millie dixon twice a week on an average and she always did look fresh yet she must be eight and twenty i determined to walk if i could do so without risking a sunstroke 
the first parasol of my acquaintance that passed should be my refuge provided the bearer was not too stout i am stoutish myself a white gown was tripping tripping towards the club window which from a certain trick of carriage should belong to mrs loring chatterton i calculated my time carefully and stepped from the club awning to the shelter of the sunshade mrs loring is slight my dear mr butterfield how do you do thank you my dear lady i replied with a little basting i shall do to a turn oh isn't it she said i never knew such heat in may you must feel it terribly mr butterfield now i am not so stout as all that thirteen four for a bachelor approaching forty and of a personable height is no extravagant riot of flesh i admit to a certain warmth i replied but when your own permit me to say somewhat meagre presence has ripened to a more generous noontide perhaps you will resent any ostentatious sympathy on the subject mrs loring laughed she always refused to take my dignity seriously to her i am not rollo butterfield l l d ceased to practise but mr butterfield who may be allowed to see the children in bed should he wish it and who is sacrificed on the altar of intimacy to take in to dinner nervous schoolgirls and act as escort and general convenience in shopping expeditions well said mrs loring i don't think you ought to mind at your time of life let me see how much older than loring are you mrs loring chatterton perhaps you prefer to walk to wilton place alone it must be rather hard on you said this incorrigible lady laughing i looked at the sunshade and at the glare that shone mercilessly on my patent leathers decision of action was never my strong point and the firmest principles will soften at ninety-two in the shade i capitulated compromise beneath a parasol was better than dignity in the sun we walked along by the exercise of much ingenuity in mapping out a track that should consist of the maximum of shade by the strategic use of large vans and the skirting of a person with a huge umbrella whose shadow was as that of a great rock in a thirsty land we arrived at wilton place and in response to mrs loring's invitation to come and have tea i followed her in mrs loring's drawing-room was cool as a cloister i foundered on to a sofa and closed my eyes while my hostess as a last impertinence vaporized me in passing with a tiny scent fountain that left me in a luxury of dim light such a retreat at my time of life was very soothing my meridian was pretty near the full and i had a right to a drowsy siesta before facing again the afternoon glow whose level rays would decline to the long evening i lazily watched a fly that was spinning a soft drone in the twilighted room and blinked through my half-closed eyes at the few white splashes of sunlight on the floor vivid in the subdued tone bowls of flowers cooled the air with perfume and the genius of rest brooded over the place the afternoon with its business would come no doubt but for the present this was my oasis mrs loring reappeared in a tea-gown whose gossamer frothed daintily about her neck she looked the pink of freshness and yet she was within three years of thirty i took a kind of pleasure in the thought loring was a lucky man a tray was brought in and this attentive lady fluttered round the little silver urn and ministered to my paresa with tea and lemon i grew humorously melancholy and lapsed into gentle vistas of reminiscence i believe i sighed mrs loring mentally referred the sigh to corpulence for she came over with tea and said there poor man that will cool you i half rose from my reclining posture and shook my head as i took the cup no madam i said tea leaves cannot allay the dust of memory i sigh for what once was for what might have been now i sigh for ten years back do you ever sigh for ten years back from the puzzled way in which she looked at me she evidently did not 
ten years back i continued you and i were yet young she tried to look wrinkled ten years back you were interested in painting and visited the national gallery milly dixon was also interested in painting and also visited the national gallery loring chatterton didn't give a hang for painting yet he dragged me round to the national gallery i paid the sixpences anyway you were always glad enough to see milly dixon you didn't do it out of pure self-sacrifice the national gallery i continued not heeding the interruption is one of the great storehouses of the world's art it is the pride of a great nation i went there for purposes of study but how did you profit by it you used it for rubbing shoulders and squeezing hands i know how you profited by it said mrs loring laughing you used to study the water colours downstairs and you got locked in one day milly dixon by the way got locked in too milly dixon always had foresight i said musingly but you never painted and milly dixon did in spite of your insinuation mrs loring i never ascertained that her complexion then you ought to have done here are you two still hanging on in the same position as ten years ago i gave millicent a month if she knew her business loring and i didn't take so long i'm disappointed in you i'm sure it's not milly's fault that was hardly fair milly had never thrown herself at me if you'd made love to millicent she went on you'd not have been a lonely fat old bachelor living in a horrid flat and wasting your time at clubs and race meetings mrs loring chatterton i replied if i'd made love to millicent i should have been just as mature of outline and should still have been a bachelor it is my gift i was born a bachelor i should have said miss dixon if you love me let me remain a bachelor she would have said as a bachelor you first loved me be always my own bachelor it is alas my single talent i was made for singleness rubbish you know you like millicent dear madam i like all ladies as a garden of flowers yet i cannot bring myself to pluck one then why do you sigh for ten years back that is the worst of women they have a way of being suddenly logical when no one expects it of them mrs loring is a charming woman but i must be careful one or two lapses into sentiment like this and she will have me married to miss dixon before i know where i am but my weakness was over i pulled myself together a burning white spot of sunshine had been slowly crossing the floor in my direction had mounted the sofa and was threatening to disturb my repose it brought back the hot streets and the stifling club and was invading my sanctuary with vivid glare i was moving along out of its way when a bell rang oh and the tea's cold said mrs loring with the first thought of a hostess i'll have to get some more in miss millicent dixon entered unannounced my dear molly cried miss dixon if you love me give me some tea oh, how do you do mr butterfield do you know moll i have been rushing about for two mortal hours trying to find a wedding present for madge beaumont and i haven't got one do help me mr butterfield oh don't ask him mrs loring struck in mr butterfield's been getting sentimental between ourselves milly he came dangerously near to a lucid interval he's been sighing over a misspent life and wishing he were years younger is it announced yet mr butterfield inquired millicent mischievously who is she promise to tell milly before any one else mr butterfield said mrs loring the machinating married woman no bachelor is safe with her i said nothing then it is true said miss dixon and i shall need two wedding presents mr butterfield the unassailable bachelor i shall give you paradise lost mr butterfield ladies i answered you are unfair you catch me in a weak moment suffering from sunstroke and accuse me of good resolutions does my previous bad character go for nothing may i not have a half-hour's weakness without hearing of it again
it is my first offence oh how difficult is the true bachelor ideal then you are not engaged mr butterfield said millicent not to my knowledge miss dixon i admit to a certain wavering if it comes again i shall take you into my confidence in the meantime we will discuss miss beaumont's wedding present we went into committee on the subject i was still the complete bachelor but i had presentiments end of episode five Episode six of the Complete Bachelor by Oliver Onions. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Episode six: A Corner in Treacle. I could not help smiling as I rang Mrs. Kit Carmichael's bell. It wanted a good hour to calling time, and I was sure to arrive in that embarrassing period of the afternoon when morning attire is being exchanged for the tea gown, and the indiscreet visitor is left to meditate on the hollowness of social obligations in an empty drawing room. It is an hour I take a peculiar delight in. I like to see the piano before Schubert's songs have replaced the thumbed exercise book and to divine midday practising scarcely over by young ladies lanky and stocking with surreptitious chewing gum in their pockets it still has the charm that going behind had for me in my early theatrical days i had made some masculine pretext for leaving carrie behind and she was to follow later i had a small reason of my own for wishing to see mrs kit alone mrs kit's maid admitted me that young person always seems inclined to laugh when she sees me i swear i have never encouraged her the drawing-room door was opened to me but i walked past it beckoned by a distant sound of childish romping and a young mother's call of come here chris i made all the noise in my approach that pretended stealth demanded i am delicate in my freedom now that is a part that needs a nice discrimination in the true performing of it intimacy has no severer test show me the indiscreet bachelor friend whose title falls short be it only by a syllable of the full warranty and i will show you a man who shall wait for invitations and to whom the fiery sword of not at home shall be displayed the young wife in particular is apt to be touchy my approach had been heard and a subdued scuffling subsided as i entered the half-open nursery door mrs kit had a maid and had at one time kept a nurse but the nurse had gracefully relinquished the engagement on finding she had two children in charge the grown-up one scarcely more manageable than the chubby little imp who bore his father's name consequently master christopher occupied a good deal of his mother's time and was in a fair way for being spoiled this young gentleman of four hailed me with a shout and childish glee in his scantiness of garment while his mother rosy and bright with romping did her best to look crossly on my intrusion mrs carmichael always keeps up an appearance of formality even with me mr butterfield how dare you come into my nursery mrs carmichael i replied i came to have a talk with your son in the matter of a certain giant in whom we are both interested perhaps you yourself would care chris shall not hear any story till he has his pinafore on it is as well you are a bachelor mr butterfield you would spoil the best child in the world unless i am mistaken mrs kit i answered you yourself were playing the part of a bear when i entered does one hunt bears without a pinafore i am his mother and have to amuse him judiciously returned mrs carmichael you don't know what a responsibility children are mr butterfield i appreciate your feelings madam i replied i remember in my youth i kept white mice now white mice white fiddlesticks said mrs kit a bachelor has absolutely no idea of what trouble children are they take the whole of your time they are constantly to be watched you never know what mischief they are up to i kept four white mice mrs carmichael with power to add you have only one oh but chris is so mischievous he's so full of spirits 
scarcely an hour since he nearly broke his neck trying to climb a handrail under the impression it was a beanstalk that was one of your stories mr butterfield and last night he managed to get simple simon into his prayers i shook my head an inherited irreligious tendency i replied he's probably got that from his father i remember kit rubbish it's just pure animal spirits chris is getting so big and strong and noisy she added as chris broke away with the shout of pagan infancy in that case mrs carmichael i answered a reducing diet of cinder tea judiciously administered cinder tea what do you know about cinder tea chris put your arm through here a bachelor talking about cinder tea the arrogance of these young married ladies they are all alike you may have seen scores of such pretty innocents installed in their first establishments you may have known their existence from the time they played peg-top with their brothers to their perky airs over their first long frocks you may have given them away amid rice and slippers at the rate of two a year when their bridal blushes almost made your task superfluous you may have known them from teething ring to trousseau from measles to marriage and yet in the first wonder of a new baby life you will be told that you are an ignorant old bachelor and that you know nothing of household affairs but i was not disposed to take any such talk from mrs kit carmichael i was too old a friend of carmichael's and could always make her tingle with curiosity by an artful hint of prenuptial reminiscence besides which she herself was too much in my power distinctly i had a right to rebuke her i leaned back and questioned her with forensic severity mrs carmichael i said you are young but that is no excuse for ingratitude five years ago my advice was not superfluous whose experience was it selected you this little house when kit's mind was too full of love to distinguish such details as sanitary arrangements i believe you gave some advice on the subject mr butterfield she retorted and we had workmen about the place for six months i waived the thanklessness of the last phrase and continued with dignity who put you through an exhaustive course of salads mrs carmichael well you were rather useful in the matter of salads she admitted reluctantly who gave you lessons in the refinements of black coffee i continued warming in a righteous cause my coffee was not bad mrs kit returned on her defence i magnanimously put aside criticism of her coffee and went on with a wave of my hand to whom did you come for counsel on distemper and wall decoration and tapestry hanging who told you to cast on at the bottom in mending stocking knees who explained to you the principle of the chimney draught the law of ventilation and the mechanics of the picture cord answer me mrs carmichael she combed master chris's hair vigorously and made no response i saw the victory of a just rebuke within my grasp i made one more thrust and finally mrs carmichael have you made the treacle puffs you promised for my next visit she yielded oh i am so sorry mr butterfield but they were a failure i put them into the oven and all the treacle ran and made oh such a mess i leaned back with the magnanimity of a conqueror and in that moment lost the battle carrie stood in the doorway treacle puffs rollo she said of course they run if you forget the bread crumbs i told you that i was betrayed by her i called sister a light came into mrs kit's eyes did you give him those recipes carrie she asked of course i did alice and told him to be sure to tell you about the bread crumbs and he didn't oh rollo she turned to me and you asked me if they would be sure to run without the bread crumbs i was lost mrs carmichael rose and put aside the brush and comb so mr butterfield she said i begin to see you laid a trap for me you got caroline to coach you in things before coming to see me and edited the recipes let me remember you told me did you not that brown sugar improved poached eggs mrs carmichael i began she silenced me with a gesture 
you advised me did you not that macaroni should be kept in a dark place for fear it should sprout that mrs carmichael was on the authority of the times you surely again the peremptory finger reduced me to dumbness and you stepped in after all my blunders and airily set me right mr butterfield you are an unspeakable deception this was my thanks carrie and i might conspire to do good by stealth i might go out of my way to gather hints on pastry and because forsooth this woman's execution was not equal to the brilliance of the idea i was to be branded as a fraud the brown sugar was an original notion and if forsooth like the great eastern it turned out unmanageable in practice that did not detract from the boldness of the conception women are so conservative they lacked the true inventor's spirit i looked helplessly round the room i was overpowered at the ease with which people will impute to one a base motive rather than go out of the beaten track to find a good one how they give themselves away i turned and apostrophized master christopher my poor unwitting little boy for you too the time shall come when ingratitude shall be your portion you are a bachelor yourself you drink cinder tea but the day shall arrive when you shall be told you know less about it than the hand that pours it out play while you can your least word is heeded now but afterwards you shall cry wisdom in the nursery and shall not be regarded chris saw somehow that he was the subject of remark and now trimly toileted and elaborately combed was ready for a story grim in giant and spiced with goblin his mother laughing at my apostrophe made a chubby fleshy fold in the childish cheek that was pressed against her own and looked at me in a way that admitted my capacity in fairy lore if it discounted my more practical qualifications now chris she said mr butterfield is going to tell you just a short story and i'm going to receive my callers don't be long mr butterfield come caroline she vanished and i entered the magical land of giants end of episode six episode seven of the complete bachelor by oliver onions this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Episode 7. Three's Company I had been told nothing about it, but I would have wagered my boot trees that Carrie and Bassishaw had had a tiff. In the first place, Carrie had invited me to accompany them to the opera when she knew that my acceptance was possible, which was contrary to her usual practice my presence on such occasions had of late been not indispensable and these young people had gone about together with an aggressive air of sufficiency in each other's company that had insulated them from my attentions and led me to muse on the thanklessness of youth are you going out with arthur this evening my dear i had asked why yes rollo she had replied diffidently arthur particularly wanted to take me to st james hall it is a refining entertainment i haven't heard moore and burgess for a long time i think i'll come with you my sister evaded the main point and countered on the inessential it's not moore and burgess she replied it's a ballad concert on the banks of the wabash far away i answered a simple sentiment would suit me exactly this evening yes i think i'll come thank you caroline i should like you to rawl dear you know but your cold oh of course my cold i didn't know i had one but they had made a chronic asthmatic of me lately and besides rawl mr chatterton said he might call this evening i'm awfully sorry dear but can you come to-morrow to the globe matinee they knew my prospective engagements better than i knew them myself there was a trifling foolish committee meeting toward to-morrow and with that i had to be content but a tiff is the complete bachelor's opportunity and in the invitation to tristan i spied entertainment carrie had sunk gently on my knee and had placed a small finger through a buttonhole in my coat bassishaw had just called 
dressed with the immaculate precision of one who has made up his mind to sulk in his stall and had taken up a book on jurisprudence which i kept conscientiously on my table an imposing reminiscence of my younger days he watched carrie furtively over the top of it please rawl she said the finger working detrimentally through the buttonhole you know you love tristan and jean and edouard but three cannot listen to tristan i said whose hand am i to she came closer and a mute look in her eyes said that an irrevocable destiny had made of her life a blighted tract but my cold caroline i asked consumptively oh rollo you shall have hot rum directly you come in and i'll nurse you do come i acceded with secret joy on the condition of being spared the remedy she suggested then we will dine out i added we did so in a gloomy depression of spirits that was eminently desirable carrie's humour was not improved by the sight of a man at the next table apparently chastely minded but who took chutney to a grilled steak she has an instinct for dietetic refinements and looked on culinary barbarity as worse than untruthfulness i had to do most of the talking which i did i think in a naive unconsciousness of the summer cloudlet that loomed glowingly over the party i spoke of youth i said heaven forgive me that it was the happiest period of life that when the heart smiled in love the skies had a blueness and much more of the same kind bassishaw grunted remarks on the transvaal prospect and for carrie's benefit muttered something about shipment of troops and leave-taking at waterloo i'm going to see about my kit to-morrow he added and drank three liqueurs recklessly three liqueurs is a great compliment to the girl you love for the very abandonment of careless devilry carrie tried feebly to show unconcern as to their effect on his constitution and i took coffee in huge enjoyment bassishaw tipped the waiter with imprudent extravagance hailed a passing hansom cab passing not passing hansom i ventured to observe but got no response and magnanimously bowed carrie and myself into the cab saying he would follow i told carrie on the way that i could not have wished a more desirable brother-in-law at the opera i modestly took the end stall of the three but carrie moved me along she then settled herself listlessly on my right while bassishaw who had arrived glowered at the side drums on my left he was utterly indifferent to the entrance of the conductor and the overture to tristan evidently brought no peace to his soul he fumed unholily and threw himself about in his seat in a way that drew a remonstrating remark from an ardent wagnerite on his left at the end of the first act he went out for a cigarette apologizing with formality as carrie gathered up her gown to allow him to pass carrie's pretty neck bowed a graceful aloofness when his straight back disappeared behind the curtain my sister throwing a slanting glance to see if he turned around i sought her eyes and leaned over speaking softly was it about your writing my literary little sister i asked she assented with a little gulp tell me my dear i said turning my back on the wagnerite next arthur's empty seat who was talking the cult rather stridently she told me in pure innocence of the conflict between literature and love she spoke of the devotion to work and the sacredness of a mission the dear little soul was going to enlighten the peoples and i asked arthur's opinion she said her breast rising never till then had i realized the forgetfulness of love arthur's opinion on literature and what did arthur say caroline i asked composing myself as best i could he said he didn't want women to be clever and they had no business to be he thought they only ought to be pretty and i was only inking my fingers then i told him what george eliot said and he said i'd been reading half hours with the best authors and then you quarrelled yes arthur entered at this moment and stumbled back to his seat 
the wagnerite broke off gertrudemerung at the third syllable and i fancy arthur had trodden on his toes i had great sympathy with arthur i particularly liked his views on the art question but he would have to unbend to this poor little child on my right she had turned her head on her shoulder during the love duet and i could not see her face i held out my hand for her opera glasses and raised them to my eyes the lenses were wet with tears i suspected it i quietly passed them on to bassishaw with the message still moist upon them it is only once in a lifetime you see tristan through such a medium the next interval bassishaw did not smoke but remained in his stall he had heard the love duet too i turned to him that was wonderful music bassishaw i said yes he replied do you know butterfield i think it's awful fine by jove i can understand johnny's doing this kind of thing you know quite so i answered to the artist's soul i capitalized the words pompously with my voice to the artist soul creation is not a choice but a need the french realize that in their word besogne he was not listening and broke in you know butterfield a johnny must have a darned useful brain box on him to do that that sort of thing it made me feel no end queer there's an awful lot in it don't you think poor bassishaw thought he understood the music but it was the opera glasses that had fetched him he went on it's darned funny that a chap should do that instead of drill and depot work you know butterfield you know i always thought too confounded much of curves and trajectory and all that stuff i always thought a chap was a bit of a muff who fooled with music and verses and all that do you know the confession was not without a touch of the pathetic but i maintained a diplomatic silence after a thoughtful pause he continued do you think rollo do you think would would carrie ever do anything of that sort i i mean uh, something that makes a chap feel oh hang it you know what i mean what could i say my little sister was looking very miserable abstract truth is all very well i temporized well bassishaw it can't be done without trying you've got to stick at it the continual enfantement i know he interrupted sort of keep it up steady like these gunnery johnnies it must be darned hard do you know butterfield he said dropping his voice suddenly carrie and i we've had a kind of nothing you, you know but a, a, a bit of a split you surprise me i replied yes we have really and i think i was a bit of a brute he rambled in explanations which i punctuated with dear dear carrie laid her hand on my sleeve and i turned to her rawl she whispered do send arthur for some coffee i want to talk to you arthur was dispatched to find a waiter and i attended carrie's pleasure while she twisted her fingers nervously through the opera glasses rawl she said i'm so unhappy the wings of sorrow have brushed your life and left it an arid waste i replied sententiously hugely amused she didn't divine the raillery but surely rawl the heart is ripened through suffering she replied unconsciously yes i replied the separation of souls is not eternal those we love are severed from us in the flesh but in heaven she looked suspiciously but my face was very grave the waiter appeared with coffee and arthur resumed his seat this time without apology he was anxious to make it up but i didn't offer him my seat i wanted to see the particular kind of finesse he would adopt so lay low and watched him the music recommenced and caroline by some inattentiveness retained her coffee cup which i believe she mentally identified with isolde's love potion bassishaw was revolving ways and means but the cup hint was not obvious to him isolde began the liebestod song while the head of the wagnerite beyond arthur was sunk in his hands possibly not to see the corpulent heroine whose presence was somewhat disturbing to the music the wagner hush was over all it was broken by bassishaw 
unable to resolve the difficulty he cut the knot his hand came over my knee and took the hand of caroline that was hanging in limp appeal nearest him she turned her face away but allowed the hand to remain it was all over and i leaned back to commune with my thoughts and to adjust my mind to the prospect of being once more a superfluity i say butterfield old chap bassishaw whispered to me do you mind changing places this is rather awkward you know it is conspicuous i replied but commendably frank i rather admire your way of doing these things bassishaw but we can't change now you'll have to wait your opportunity of giving me the slip in the foyer i've no doubt you'll attempt it it would do them no harm to wait a while End of episode 7Episode 8 of The Complete Bachelor by Oliver Onions. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Episode 8 A Veteran Recruit Millicent Dixon's uncle, Colonel Elliot Coke, invalided from some remote Afghan frontier station, whose name on the map was utterly out of proportion to the inconsiderableness of the place, was in London. I met him at the Bassishaw's when Arthur, in tones of infinite respect, had pointed out to my notice a small, keen face, curried by Indian suns, with moustaches out of which both the colour and the moisture had been grilled years and years before. "'I say, Rollo,' Bassishaw had whispered, "'do you know who that is? That's Colonel Coke.' "'It's a good name,' I observed. "'Who's he?' who's he i say rollo why he's the best authority on hill batteries and jungle skirmishes in india led an attack on some darned place or other in well, i forget the date v c went through the afghan war you know got about a hundred and fifty clasps indeed i said present me arthur had presented me to his hero almost apologetically and i had since improved the acquaintance considerably i gathered from the colonel that the afghan frontier was not overrun with european ladies to any great extent and certainly the little man's manner on being transported to a place where a full numerical half of the population and a much larger proportion in every other respect consisted of women was very pleasant to watch the luxury of seeing them was almost enough for him and when it came to the intimacies of conversation the little warrior's embarrassment was as delightful as young ted carmichael's gad butterfield he said as we threaded piccadilly one evening this is home you know it's like one big family you feel as if you can speak to any of them the colonel's observation was perhaps truer than he had any idea of but i couldn't dash his boyish pleasure yes i replied i almost envy you the delight coke of having the full measure all at once it is to you what tiger shooting would be to me did my taste run in that direction gad he replied he seldom replied without gad it's marvellous and all with faces as white as my own butterfield i smiled looking at the piece of tropical cookery he called white but let him run on do you know he said there was powell's wife and poor jack dennis's widow and the adjutant's sister and by gad except for a dai that powell kept powell's wife was never strong there wasn't another woman butterfield in the whole damn station and winifred dennis didn't amount to much but here he never seemed to get accustomed to it had a london fog stamped the metropolitan complexion indelibly and universally black coke would have given a sigh as knowing that his glimpse was too good to have lasted and returned to his old order of things the rustle of a silk skirt was an unstaled wonder to him and the contrast between what he called the real european baby ribbon sort of thing and the infernal blouse and puggery business never failed to entertain him with miss dixon he was soon on good terms but with most other ladies mrs loring chatterton first of all his diffidence was marked his chivalrous devotion was quixotic but most of them would have bartered it i am sure for a more workaday and less punctilious style of attention 
mrs loring indeed said so i don't know where he got his style of conversation from she remarked but he is absolutely embarrassed when i present him to a woman how do you account for it mr butterfield it is not i replied that he is deficient in physical bravery i can only account for it on the supposition of instinct he knows your propensities mrs loring and would possibly die as he has lived a blameless bachelor but it's just the same with the married women he returned what is there to be afraid of in alice carmichael i decline to be invidious mrs loring i replied he gets along well enough with millicent dixon they are related she replied somewhat inconclusively i am afraid it is a non sequitur i answered friendship generally varies inversely as the square of the distance of the relationship i wonder what we could do she said half to herself do you think mrs gervaise would do him any good the wicked wedded creature emily gervaise a youthful widow was cicely vicar's sister i drew myself up with dignity mrs loring i said looking full at her i wonder that you do not tremble what is it you would do has colonel coke of a score of indian hill fights the bearer of honourable scars of war and climate not earned his peace would you now that his body is broken on the outposts of an empire for your protection harrow the boyish soul within it no madam on me if you will you may exercise your arts but if you once submit that venerable head to the machinations of emily gervaise i expose you exercise arts on you she retorted you're too fond of it and i shall be nice to the colonel in spite of you mr butterfield she kept her word she indulged her undoubted gifts of being nice to people in a series of variations the theme of which was always the same the development of the colonel's intimacy with mrs gervaise mrs loring's methods were old enough to me i knew them by heart but to the maiden soul of the colonel they came as a revelation of female unselfishness do you know butterfield he said to me one evening i'm beginning to think mrs chatterton is no end of a fine woman by gad she's loyal by gad the way she stands by that little friend of hers mrs gervaise you know her i nodded why it's just what a man would do then you have met mrs gervaise coke i asked yes he replied the other evening she's infernally shy by gad quiet you know that's what i like about an english woman here now powell's wife and the regimental women exactly we're not shy and what do you think of mrs gervaise well you know the little man looked at me with a comical air of worldly knowledge that was a joy to see she was awfully quiet butterfield only looked at you but i brought her out by gad and she's intelligent too when you once get her talking you succeeded in making her talk then i asked with an irony that was for my private satisfaction and meant nothing to him yes he replied after i'd played her a bit you know and that woman butterfield displayed an intelligence by gad on transport and commissariat and mobilization that was simply little short of marvellous marvellous by gad she's a clever woman i believe i answered she asked you how often you had been wounded i suppose she did ask me that he admitted but women haven't got to hear about that kind of thing you know butterfield you've got to keep em at arm's length in such matters kind of exactly play them a bit i congratulate you colonel on having a uh, brought out mrs gervaise oh he replied she's only a child of course widow or no widow but she'll make a fine woman butterfield i would have given much that emily gervaise should have heard herself set down a child the colonel unconsciously had in his hand the opportunity for complete and sweeping revenge it was my fortune to present when mrs gervaise doubtless after deep consideration made the next move we were to call on mrs charles vickers or rather coke was to call and persuaded me along with him mrs chatterton said you wouldn't mind butterfield he said 
and by gad i can't keep two of them going you undervalue yourself coke i said but i'll come and so we found ourselves in the aestheticism of mrs vicker's drawing-room that lady found means to entertain me while coke applied himself to the creation of a conversational warmth that should induce the unfolding of the timid bud by his side colonel coke seems to have taken quite a fancy to emily mr butterfield said mrs charley interrogatively it is a pretty sight mrs vicars i replied the scarred veteran in the evening of his life his grim battles behind him returning to take a younger generation on his knee mrs vicars looked round in alarm and to tell of fights in which their fathers were engaged colonel coke is not so old as that mr butterfield he can't be much older than you she interrupted he is young enough to be emily's father i admitted and perhaps a little too juvenile to be her grandfather coke is fifty he doesn't look at mr butterfield he looks at mrs vicars and you know it let us talk about something else how is master percival is his name to be the young gentleman in question had known the light of day for exactly three weeks and was the commencement of cicely vicars family i had been presented to him in his cot some days before but beyond mutual celibacy there was little as yet in common between us and the conversation had flagged yes mrs vicars responded he's to be called percival and oh mr butterfield he's to be christened in a week and i wondered she hesitated i already stand sponsor to an embarrassing extent mrs vicars i replied i never ascertained precisely to what the position pledged me but i have an uncomfortable sense of responsibility to which i do not feel inclined to add but mr butterfield those were other people's children not mine she turned a supplicating eye on me it runs in the family naturally i replied it would be a big burden in these days of small families for any one person but no mrs vicars perhaps on a future occasion i have it i added you have what coax your man mrs vicars come i rose and assisted her to rise also she hung back but i brought her along it was the very thing we approached the couple the colonel was holding forth on the dialects of the northwestern provinces coke i said he looked up accept my felicitations you are to stand godfather to mrs vicars little boy next week coke blushed a vivid gamboge and stopped dead gad he stammered wha what's that butterfield sponsor my dear coke i returned at the investiture of a fellow man with a name you're just the man things were whirling round coke he grasped the edge of the sofa with both hands and looked blankly at us me he gasped me at a christening what the devil me a godfather no i'm damned if i can my dear coke i answered calm yourself of course you can you must a man with a victoria cross cannot get out of these things so easily look at me a baker's dozen at least gad he replied wiping his brow i'd rather get the cross again nonsense i replied it's a duty somebody did it for us and we keep up the tradition besides it's unlucky to have to ask twice i had no authority for this last statement but it seemed to go coke leaned back for ease in breathing but i've never done anything of the kind he almost whispered i shall shake like a recruit i shan't know what to do i shall get mixed up with the bridesmaids the colonel's notions as to the procedure of christenings were undoubtedly vague i looked at mrs gervaise this is not a wedding i said but a christening that's all right coke you shall wear your uniform and grasp the hilt of your sword all the time you'll do but but hang it butterfield what about the family you'll pardon me ladies but i you are the only members i am happy enough to know oh said mrs vicars there's only mother colonel i forgot you hadn't met her you shall to-morrow you do promise the colonel was evidently looking for flaws in the position but seemed to find none 
he rose as unhappy a little soldier as ever wore a medal well ladies he said i would rather have shot afghans for you for twelve months than undertake this this post if i break down you mustn't blame me i'll do my best and with a sigh he pulled his white moustaches nervously and we begged leave to go now my only object in all this was a half whimsical protest such as is permissible against what was evidently in the minds of both these ladies the matching of mrs gervaise with a man easily twenty years her senior the position of godfather to a succeeding generation apart from the edification of seeing such a man as coke in such a capacity was much more suitable than any wedding so uneven and i had allowed myself to hint as much but coke himself as he afterwards told me had carried the thing a good deal further it was in the smoke-room of the faneant club that i heard its conclusion the ceremony was over and coke was composing his nerves with green indian cigars he had sat meditatively watching the smoke for some time when he suddenly looked up and caught my eye well butterfield he said i got it over but by gad never again they shall call deserters next time for me yes i said inquiringly yes he replied it was this way butterfield i called on mrs vicars next day and met her mother and by gad butterfield the colonel threw his cigar away in his excitement and faced full round on me it was little sissy Monroe who threw me over before i left thirty years ago by gad he sank back in his chair you could have pulled my shoulder straps off i knew her in a minute i didn't know whether she was living or dead butterfield i'm used to my friends dying and there by gad she turns up my stars it beats all it was certainly a coincidence and the awkward part of the whole thing was i don't mind telling you butterfield that i'd all but taken a fancy to that quiet little daughter of hers mrs gervaise well i was all at sea the whole thing was too infernally odd it didn't seem right somehow that i should be thrown over by one woman make love to her daughter and be godfather to what might have been my own grandchild by gad and i was in no end of a mess don't you think so i admitted the questionableness of the proceeding well i could not get out of the confounded christening thanks to you butterfield but as to mrs gervaise that was another matter i can help that and she's a good little woman too he added if she were not so infernally modest by gad i think it is perhaps better coke i replied end of episode eight episode nine of the complete bachelor by oliver onions this librivox recording is in the public domain Episode 9. The Ethics of Angling I don't quite know how Mrs. Loring came to pick the Gibsons up. They were not what Carrie termed quite nice people. In what respect, it was easy to see and difficult to say. Their jewellery was unexceptionable and barely ostentatious. Their manners passed the presentation standard, if falling a little short in the nicer requirements of tete a -tete. They did not offend in the matter of Mr. and Esquire, but sniffed somewhat of RSVP. Mrs. Gibson, too, insisted on the forms of chaperonage in a way that was rather more than a passing bow to custom, and which suggested the possibility of her having learned the necessity in a different school from that of Mrs. Loring Chatterton. They had money. "'What do you think of the Gibsons, Rawl? Carrie had said to me. "'I don't like them.' "'I would rather introduce them to my relatives than to my friends,' I replied." it was pretty evident to me after a short acquaintance with the gibsons that they were disposed to make much of me carrie noticed the same thing and spoke her mind on the subject with the freedom of engaged youth mrs gibson's a horrid woman rawl and it's my opinion she wants you to marry miss gibson caroline i replied i applaud your concern yet cannot blame mrs gibson she can see virtue where others see but corpulence. 
besides i consider miss gibson rather pretty i'm sure she's not pretty retorted caroline and proceeded to enlighten me on matters interesting and feminine mamma played the only game she knew very skilfully her only mistake was in the inapplicability of the means which was not her fault indeed i feel almost apologetically responsible myself seeing the line worked so thoroughly and mused in Constructively on the devotion of a mother to her child's prospects miss gibson was accomplished and expensively finished as i had remarked to carrie she was decidedly pretty and would talk ibsen to you with her face in profile she displayed an obtrusive girlhood that was not always as modest as its intention and this pose of maidenhood in bud was apparently the one designed to net me mrs gibson gave a musicale to which i persuaded carrie with difficulty she had evidently talked things over with mrs loring for that lady appeared also and i was greatly gratified at the concern with which they watched me i decided to give them all the entertainment they desired they talked with an obvious intention of interesting me and keeping me apart from miss gibson i was surprised to see so little strategy in a married woman miss gibson was running a risk of palsying her hand in a vibrant mandolin solo and producing music suggestive of the dotted line of a wheel-pen i heard carrie whisper to mrs loring something about st vitus's waltz for which i reproved her considering whose house she was in i then addressed mrs loring somehow mrs loring i said one thinks more of english maidenhood as one advances in life there is something in the unsophisticated rosebud mrs loring nodded significantly implying there was a good deal in the unsophisticated rosebud but i waited my time i had a bolt in store for her miss gibson had finished the solo in a tinsel diminuendo the intent of which was to enchain the soul a while longer in the regions to which it had been raised i rose and crossed over to her she was untangling herself from a mesh of coloured mandolin ribbons that would catch in the ruching of her corsage they're such a nuisance mr butterfield i shall cut them off i think i smiled at the unintentional suggestion and assisted her in the extrication glancing across at mrs loring's disapproving face miss gibson sat down and made room for me beside her she twined the mandolin ribbons among her fingers and mrs gibson moved further away are you leaving town soon mr butterfield inquired the unsophisticated rosebud engagingly it was a better opening than i had looked for i took advantage of it i had meditated going down into the country for a little fishing shortly i replied probably in a week or two you are fond of fishing are you not mr butterfield she inquired tying a knot in a red ribbon it's a pleasure i answered as much of the mind as of the body i know of nothing more exciting than the suspense of the first nibble the angler male or female has peculiar joys and fears of which the layman knows nothing oh i should so love it replied miss gibson glancing down at a small shoe that protruded from the lacy hem of her skirts i followed her glance and knew in my soul that mrs loring and carrie were watching me the first nibble taken i continued warming to my work all the finesse of playing your victim commences there is a wide difference between hooking your fish and landing him he must be humoured and coaxed or you lose him bait and all i took one of the ribbons in my hand it must be most annoying to have all your trouble for nothing is it not mr butterfield you follow me perfectly i replied especially when you have made sure of your fish often enough you have chosen the wrong fly or your line has been seen by the fish and he is a shy thing a very timid creature she laid ground bait for me by dropping her fan i nibbled again and returned it to her the fish too becomes cunning with age and you must not play a middle-aged trout as a boy does a minnow believe me miss gibson he is not easily caught if he is worth the landing 
mrs gibson passed with a smile but did not disturb the situation i rose to get miss gibson an ice and resumed my seat near her she placed the mandolin on the other side adjusted her gown and diminished the distance between us by an inch again her fan dropped and as we both stooped to pick it up our hands touched honestly i acquit miss gibson of intention yet another method of landing your trout i continued is by what is called tickling but then your fish must be asleep and it cannot fairly be classed as sport but surely mr butterfield said miss gibson playing me with her eyes fishing must be very cruel fancy the poor thing with the hook doesn't it hurt i believe i returned they rather enjoy it miss gibson particularly what is called the softer mouthed kind of fish how very curious said the credulous rosebud somewhat absently she evidently took my remarks on the subject as so much natural history and was interested in them only as such she glanced at the mandolin ribbons and i saw her revolving means of supplementing the line by the net she made a fresh cast and how long do you expect to be away mr butterfield mrs loring and carrie were approaching but mrs gibson who had not apparently been watching intercepted them and dammed the stream adroitly carrie was placed at the piano and the preserve maintained inviolate mrs loring talked sweetly to her hostess with one eye on me i could not say i replied until my friends yearn for me back again i suppose she made the response elementary and shortened her line but your friends will be sorry to lose you at all she replied with a soft sparkle under her lashes i'm sure mother will indeed i answered my friends conceal their desire for my presence with most generous consideration i am allowed great liberty oh mr butterfield how can you say so i ought not to have done it i reproach myself for it but the temptation miss gibson was really nice if not quite nice it was unfair but i am of no stronger fibre than my fellow-men as i leaned forward i knew that the landing-net was ready and the gaff poised i sought her eyes and spoke low shall you be sorry to lose me miss gibson the colour rose faintly on her cheek she hesitated her eyes cast down she had not fallen in love with me it was the mother's doing help came from outside mrs gibson blinked her vigilance for one short moment carrie crowded the last few bars of music into an accelerando that would have harrowed the soul of the composer and she and mrs loring were upon us oh miss gibson said carrie with a sweetness of expression that astonished me considering the real state of her feelings do please play again rollo and i must go very shortly and we should so love to hear you won't you dear we cannot possibly leave without implored mrs chatterton nothing was possible but compliance and miss gibson took her seat near the piano mrs loring and caroline mounted determined guard over me one on each side but didn't speak it was not until we were on the way home that the storm broke rollo butterfield said mrs loring icily i'm deeply surprised at you and why my dear mrs loring i asked blandly did you propose to that that gibson girl proposal mrs loring i replied is an excitement that would be of more general indulgence but for the risk of acceptance it is a valuable sensation and i greatly regret its attendant danger you have no more perception than a child don't you know that those people are doing all they can to catch you i never saw anything so shameless she had asked for it and she should have it mrs loring i replied slowly and distinctly your ingenuousness charms me you call mrs gibson's conduct shameless yet you yourself would empty half the bachelors clubs in london 
i forget precisely the number of years it is since you first endeavoured to curtail my own celibate freedom but i believe you have devoted no small part of your attention to my poor case milly dixon is different she retorted of course millicent was different but i held her to the logic we are not discussing millicent but the ethics of angling i am surprised that you should not recognize your own position in the matter you do not want me to be more precise i don't want you to be anything but moderately sane she returned if you can't see the difference between the gibsons and millicent dixon she left me to conclude the sentence for myself mrs loring chatterton was in a bad temper and evaded the argument pettishly i turned to caroline has my little sister anything to say i asked in a come one come all tone she hadn't she cuddled her face against my shoulder and pulled nervously at her glove fingers but rawl dear she said anxiously what were you and miss gibson talking about i took her hand nothing caroline i replied but a few observations on the trout his habits and the method of his capture exemplifying the fact mrs loring struck in crossly that he is a cold-blooded creature mrs loring scored a bye end of episode nine episode ten of the complete bachelor by oliver onions this librivox recording is in the public domain episode ten an undress rehearsal millicent dixon had called on me unexpectedly soaked from neck to ankle i had been watching the vertical downpour from my window long heavy slate pencils of water that rebounded from the pavement in a mist a foot high and listening to the hurrying runnels that sluiced the gutters it was full uncompromising rain and it thrashed steadily from the invisible cullender that had been a sky an hour ago millicent stood before me with her hand on the door half vexed but laughing out of her sodden garments now don't sit there looking at me mr butterfield she exclaimed as i admired at her plight with eyes half closed get me some things i considered weightily i have in the house at present i replied several morning suits a norfolk jacket evening wear pink silk she tapped impatiently with her foot shaking a sliver of little droplets from the hem of her gown or perhaps fishing attire would be don't be ponderous where's caroline caroline miss dixon is out with arthur and will doubtless return in much the same state of rainwater as yourself she disappeared towards carrie's quarters her dress making a wet slap on the door as she whisked round i rose to prepare brandy during her absence it should be mentioned that i was confined to my room with a slight attack of rheumatism which my considerate friends persisted in regarding as gout as a matter of fact the affection was purely muscular and i indignantly repudiated the fuller flavour of the alleged complaint my portliness must not be confounded with decadence disconsolately enough i had been fingering and sorting old letters turning out drawer after drawer of forgotten trifles and feeling none the younger in consequence it was borne in upon me that i had a history or some record of trivialities that passed as such and these little drifted relics of the past had curiously discounted the glamour of what was going to happen to-morrow except for the unexpected shower i should probably have been left to this melancholy occupation all day and millicent's forced visit was very welcome she reappeared in garments of caroline's passable in style but with marked qualifications in the fit she tops caroline by three inches i had often wondered idly where that three inches was accounted for and how it was distributed i knew now i surveyed her critically shoulders not bad i remarked walking round her while she stood at a laughing attention for kit inspection waist turn round hm an inch and a half at most all right so long as you don't lean forward skirt ah the skirt well 
well i'm past such things really it's not bad for an improvisation i couldn't find carrie's slippers she said putting forward a small foot the skirt had already revealed the silk-clad toes i got her a particularly large pair of my own brought her the brandy which she drank like a sensible woman of twenty-eight placed her an armchair near the fire and resumed my own seat then i sought her eyes it was most thoughtful of you miss dixon to remember an invalid and to pay such a welcome call i appreciate it in the rain too irony was wasted on this shameless woman she looked at me boldly and laughed i assure you mr butterfield she replied the last thing i thought of when i left home was coming to see you but oh the rain look at it now i was conscious of the fresh smell of wet pavement from where i sat the window was open the wheels of a hansom went past with a watery swish the horses hoofs slapping clear in the deserted street and the stones shone with a cleanness that they had not known for a month at any rate i said magnanimously you're here for an hour or two it's not going to stop yet you may as well make a virtue of entertaining me she bowed mockingly it is i who am entertained she replied you have helped me in a watery dilemma i am in your home i wear your i stopped her they were not mine they were caroline's slippers she continued crossing them on the fender i think i'll take caroline's place while she's gadding about with arthur again i stopped her she was not in caroline's shoes besides miss dixon i added are you not a little premature in offering to be a sister to me never mind she replied laughing call it housekeeper if you like the imputation i answered is monstrous i am a respectable bachelor and never had such a thing and if i had she would have appeared before me in a fitting state not a misfitting one then we'd better make it sister after all she returned and my first duty is to demand what you were doing when i came in i glanced at the half-sorted piles of notes cards ancient invitations mementos and the hundred other matters which had doubtless been of more or less importance in their day and shrugged my shoulders i know said miss dixon it is rather dreadful seems like reading someone else's letters let me help you she put out her hand for the nearest packet i placed my own firmly on hers miss dixon i said slowly who are you that you would plunge thus recklessly into the tied-up part of a now reformed bachelor that particular bundle is least of all fit for a sister's perusal if caroline neglected her duty she retorted that is no reason why i should do the same i want to see them you had better take these instead i returned pushing towards her a tray of wedding cards i insist you insist i replied in the tone of one speaking to a naughty child how old are you miss dixon she laughed i think i am a good deal older than you rollo in this respect i don't keep letters as i did when i was a sentimental schoolgirl i destroyed that kind and she nodded towards the bundle indeed i said and why did you not tell me sooner that would have been valuable information to me at one time and why i might have written a good deal more than i did you never wrote anything unfitted for my sheltered youth she replied quietly smiling and burrowing one foot deeper into the cavernous recesses of a slipper i don't post all i write i corrected but i have written things that would have amazed a bassishaw and thought twice about it bassishaw doesn't say much in his letters she said musingly she and caroline were very good friends and there had doubtless been a good deal of interfeminine confidence between them but why don't you post them oh i replied off-hand they are experiments it is another way of keeping a diary perhaps after all you may see them if you care to they are merely studies in moods i untied the packet here you are i continued arthur bashishaw esquire on the occasion of his engagement to caroline 
good advice but a little too late it wouldn't have been taken anyway from what i know of his omnipotent youthfulness never posted it might have been worth while to post it for the sake of reply millicent returned smiling you'd have had something badly written but very ardent i shook my head bassishaw's sword would be a good deal mightier than his pen i replied to see him in the throes of composition is a felicity i've hitherto missed now here's another to caroline on the same occasion that millicent cost me some trouble to write and i am afraid it showed it i have only one sister you know unposted that was rather nice of you rollo she said i should only have given myself away i returned now this to mrs bassishaw is one of two the other one was posted it was a hard alternative i sent the usual nice thing mrs bassishaw would understand that this i tapped the envelope would have appeared difficult to a widow still young and still in the running with her own son millicent nodded there were reasons for mrs bassishaw's conduct which her relatives approved and her friends condoned these i continued turning over two or three are small ebullitions that served their end in leaving me in a better temper and in one at least of them i evaded a state of mind in which i was feeling very sorry for myself it is a good game don't you think excellent she returned from the point of view of your future biographer i suppose you have one eye on the memoir writer rollo is your statue to be equestrian i waved reply magnanimously and went on here is one to mrs loring chatterton and not unconnected with it one to yourself one to me she inquired looking up why to me what mood did that exemplify i think millicent i replied that i must have felt rather a regard for you that evening she bowed ironically it is nice to be thought well of she replied even if the regard does stop at the posting point it was a wet night i suppose or the servants had gone to bed the fires of the heart millicent i answered in pompous periods at which she only laughed are not quenched by rain yon gutters that run so musically could no more oh captain shaw she sang softly type of true love kept under i leaned back tapping the letter with the ends of my fingers and signified my willingness to wait until her operatic fervour should have spent itself it must have been feverish she said still laughing did it take you long to write about eight years millicent i replied and not to be posted after all never mind i suppose i shall see it in the biography i declare i'm almost curious rollo tell me is it she paused and looked fairly and quietly at me with an odd smile on her lips it is i replied returning her gaze would you care to read it millicent she rose and went to the window a cold grey light that heralded the passing of the shower filled the room the heavens were relenting and already a corner of the leaden pall had lifted millicent would probably take the opportunity to leave would you care to read it i repeated looking over my shoulder she faced round suddenly no rollo she said i should not oh, you are probably right i replied proposal is a venerable formality but the inevitable scene she walked back from the window and stood before me dignified in her heterogeneous attire and perfectly serious i thought you knew better than that rollo she said i don't think there would be any scene and anyway i'm not in my first season you know she smiled the same queer smile but if you think that i should be interested in such a matter merely as an experiment in mood you wrong me rollo and if on the other hand i am to take it in the plainer sense i should like something less warmed up and out of date you can hardly call it fervid can you i admired millicent in that moment i rose and took her hand millicent i said i accept your rebuke there is nothing further to be said just now but soon she laughed her accustomed laugh the same old millicent again
i shall be perfectly willing to consider any representations you may have to make on the matter rollo provided they are forwarded in the ordinary course will you ring for tea end of episode ten episode eleven of the complete bachelor by oliver onions this librivox recording is in the public domain episode eleven queen of love and beauty from what i was able to gather the course of young ted carmichael's love was highly meritorious in its constancy his affection was a solid reliable fact and to me correspondingly uninteresting his father i remembered had years before wooed little alice chatterton on much the same lines between which two it had been what their friends called an understood thing since the first bashful glances of adolescence in both cases this trait was regarded as a highly commendable faithfulness and invested with the usual attributes of true and undying love but to me it had less of this positive quality than appeared and argued rather a certain paucity of invention in the finer relations of amorous adventure it was admirable but the case was settled from the beginning and offered little field for speculation even its incidental tiffs and mischances being in their rise and end perfectly accountable in the case of the son his three terms at eton coming when they did might have resulted in a break from this monotonous routine of laudable love his father had been hopeless from the start but miss nelly bassishaw bade fair for freer flights during the occasional intervals of my seeing her she seemed to grow in sections and to develop in seasons and now emancipated from the last suggestion of governess was gowned and quaffed beyond the limit of girlhood true her neck still showed a whitish celery colour from the unhabitual exposure and in the management of her feet and skirt the last trace of the tomboy was disappearing but she displayed beneath an eminently suitable hat glances that promised in the near future a hundred roguishnesses and mischiefs if anything could shake ted's devotion miss nelly i decided had it young ted called on me one afternoon for no reason at all that i could discover during the first half hour of his visit he was clad point de visa bore his gloves and cane with admirable instinct and looked as fresh and trim a youth as ever received the half-motherly kiss of a widow i greeted him with pleasure and the match ted i asked when he had sat down how do you feel ted was the youngest member of the eton eleven which was to meet harrow in the annual match at lord's in a day or two a troubled look crossed his face i don't feel a bit up to it butterfield he replied i shall go and mess the confounded thing i know i shall a fellow who's playing cricket shouldn't have anything on his mind that is he paused and flushed half angrily anything wrong i asked in an off-hand tone no he replied an affirmative no nothing that matters only i prompted only this he answered with another flush that women oughtn't to have anything to do with cricket from my experience i returned they are invariably proud to see their sons playing sons he replied oh it isn't that i know my mother is all right but it doesn't matter much he concluded in a tone that was not intended as a hint to let the matter drop ah i see i replied sympathetically sorry ted of course that does make a difference when you said women i thought for a moment you oh yes it's very awkward to know that in such a crowd two eyes are aching with anxiety that you should acquit yourself well must be extremely trying to the nerves i should try to forget it he fidgeted with his gloves and then turned sharp around and suppose they were not anxious he retorted suppose they didn't care whether you came off or not hang it butterfield he continued you can imagine what it's like they think because a fellow hasn't a moustache it's enough to make a fellow go and drink rotten stuff i shan't stand it 
it was nelly i got it all out of him he had evidently come to tell me the rude health of public school life had not knocked the fancy out of him and he had come back to find her grown up and with a tendency to be interested in men ten years her senior how he had managed to get into the first eleven and to remain in love was to me one of the mysteries of constancy but i thought you would have forgotten almost ted i said in the maturity of our confidence it's a year since you went away a fellow never forgets he replied sulkily it's the girls who forget could you i passed the point and speculated on the validity of pledges on eternity and she has pardon me snubbed you i inquired after a while well no he rejoined dubiously it isn't quite that but she always seems to have engagements or something she always must be going now and she's altered so i told her so and she said we were silly then and if i muff this match it will be worse than ever i couldn't help thinking that if i had organized the female mind i should have done it more consistently but then there would probably have been no comedy in the world i was willing to help ted all i could and advised a spontaneous gaiety in her presence ted shook his head or failing that a desperate counter movement with a married woman a notion he also rejected the only suggestion that ted had to make was that i should go on to the match contrive to sit next to miss nell and what he didn't say a delicate reserve i admired you're a good chap you know butterfield he added i've told lots of our fellows what a good chap you are harrop major says so too he met you once you know butterfield i fear i had forgotten harrop major in the multiplicity of my affairs but i was properly touched i smiled at my own goodness well thanks awfully butterfield he rose to go it's awfully good of you really you're a brick thanks ted i returned i hope you'll come off all right in the match his lips twitched queerly i forbore to press the alternative contingency and he took his leave my duty apparently was to keep an eye on miss nell to diagnose her condition when ted went in to bat to mark how as should befall his success or failure was received and to exercise a discretionary supervision over the state of her heart as revealed by the vicissitudes of the game it was doubtful of what precise use i should be but it was interesting and ted was a pleasant-mannered youth it was peculiarly interesting in view of the fact that the carmichaels were a cricketing family now the purely abstract part of the game was a cult to which i had never aspired my only interest being in such personal cases as that of my young friend ted i was convinced that the progress of carmichael senior's love if it had had a progress was accelerated by the fact that he had in his eton match made fifty on a wet wicket and the question whether a similar performance on the son's part would please nelly or whether nelly would be merely pleased to see ted pleased with himself was a speculation which i followed into the nicer nuances our party accounted for a considerable segment of bench space the apex of which i contrived it consisted of miss nell and myself we were backed by tiers of carmichaels chattertons and bassishaws and penetrated wedgewise into half a division of eton younglings with close-cropped hair and large ears which looked frank admiration at nelly one keeper of the public manners with freckles and an even greater extent of white collar than the rest cuffed his neighbour for saying that she was stunning nelly heard and laughed she sat provokingly upright and shot enfilading glances to left and right beneath the brim of a hat remarkably adapted to such proceedings a pretty slim thing she was and the careless white flash between her lips unsettled ted considerably who was paying uneasy flying visits i think the harrow boys look nicer she said with a look of illicit pleasure from the shade of that eminently suitable hat and ted left with ill-feigned unconcern i remembered my mission and leaned towards her nelly i said 
do you consider that an encouraging remark to a young man whose happiness depends on his playing a straight bat and keeping his head cool oh ted's all right she returned with i was pleased to observe a touch of shame besides what does it matter it's only a game she might have had her answer from the group of eton juvenility surrounding us which broke into excited babble yes you can no you can't you can be caught off your pads fat lot you know about cricket silly ass and so forth but mr butterfield she said after a moment he will be so unbearable if he makes a lot of runs he's important enough already at being in the eleven she stooped and spoke to young eton on her right who blushed at the distinction but answered with bashful coldness besides she continued they say his average is thirty and i'm sure i don't care who wins luckily this treasonable utterance was unheard by the eton boys with whom sentiment and cricket hung in highly disproportionate balance i was satisfied at least that if it came to the worst she would be sorry for ted now eton batted first and there was little talk in our strongly prejudiced quarter ted carmichael i gathered from my neighbours was to go in third wicket down he had made a last visit this time from a different entrance but had avoided nell sitting next to bashishaw instead who had not tried to talk to him then he had disappeared i knew in my soul what was going to happen ted's nervousness at his first match and the condescending interest of miss nelly bassishaw could only have one result and i was so busy speculating on the mysteries of this dread fatality that hems us so remorselessly about that i forgot the scene for a moment and was startled back by the juvenile clamour the inevitable had happened oh oh i say what a tremor just on the bales first ball broke from the off i didn't it was a straight ball for fifty three ted was out for a duck i glanced at the slender white figure trailing a fruitless bat towards the pavilion and adjusted the knees of my trousers i commented mentally on the pattern and waited she did not speak but absently pulled off a glove the carmichaels behind slowly resumed their talk and the eton boys after marking their scoring cards took up the current of the game true liberals with them the issue transcended the individual still she did not speak but folded and unfolded the gloves i glanced up and that eminently becoming hat did not seem the same so inseparably had it been connected with the lurking ambuscade of eyes miss nell was visibly shaken i leaned towards her it's only a game nelly i began she interrupted me with a look don't be mean mr butterfield i know what you think you think it's all my fault i was silent for ted's sake and she continued slowly i don't see why men should think so much of cricket it makes them so so unbearable when they come off i replied but he must have been very nervous nelly whether or no you couldn't help that your encouragement would probably have disturbed him just as much as your as not that is the double influence of woman on the man of action neither her smiles nor her frowns help him in the least her approval is pleasant when it's all over but i'm afraid the presence of the queen of love and beauty has unhorsed many a gallant youth before to-day he makes the mistake in in having anything to do with them she queried with pretty cynicism i leaned back no in being a man of action i returned there was a sudden turn and hush among the eton boys ted reappeared and they were awed in the presence of a great grief he sat down next to me with the hard look of one who asks no sympathy folded his hands and stared at his shoes the eton boys whispered and they play me for my batting he said so softly that i scarcely heard i'm a bat a bat i'm here to make runs the belchmetz had sunk into his soul i was about to say something but checked myself as nelly bent forward ted she said i'm so sorry it's all my fault 
i folded my arms looking before me ted did not move an inch i was horrid she continued and i pretended she stopped conscious of the significance of what she was about to say she had pretended to be unconscious of her empire over his heart and was now retracting miss nelly is the modern girl with whom proposal is unnecessary ted cut her short with the brutality of male desperation all right nelly he said curtly it's not your fault i drank brandy this was a surprise to me brandy steadies the nerves but it is a remedy not recommended by the captains of cricket elevens and his boyish devilry as training was as reprehensible as it was in the spirit of comedy but nelly saw further than ted oh ted she said humbly and that is my fault too i made you angry will you forgive me it has always seemed to me that when a pretty half tearful creature asks you if you will forgive her the question is beside the mark the forgiveness not depending on whether you will or not you are not willing you would much rather not but you do precisely as ted did he squeezed her ungloved hand across my knee and an eton boy sniggered i don't know why i should have experienced a sensation as near akin to jealousy as i can locate it i pursued the moral labyrinth for a time and getting no nearer was fain to come to earth and the next innings ted nelly was saying alas what then what in ted's word had women even queens of love and beauty to do with cricket more subtle in their influence than the forbidden brandy why do not the captains demand that their followers shall be bachelors unattached ted was too blessedly happy to know certainly too happy to be let alone i spoke for his own good the next innings i remarked will exemplify the second stage of the female relation to the man of action i don't think either of them took the trouble to understand End of episode eleven episode twelve of the complete bachelor by oliver onions this librivox recording is in the public domain episode twelve a modern sabine ah that's the trouble we're all far too complex nowadays we live in a complex age i returned profoundly true very true he replied and twisted the ribbon of his eyeglass round one finger very little is left that is simple and primitive and beautiful i favoured him with the cosmic shrug of his cult and said nothing eloquently the understanding was complete cicely vicar's evening was ground i had not hitherto explored and i had marked for my own at once the young man drooping mincingly over the piano he was smooth and fair inclined to premature stoutness and looked remotely mrs vicars informed me that he was a playwright a dramatic critic and a fashion that he promised brilliant things and that the name under which he wrought was eleanor mccoyd she added that he had intuition beyond his years now people went to mrs vicars evenings for intellectual intercourse and the exchange of ideas an object in which they would not be balked carry had said as much to me you ought to come rawl she had remarked on one occasion it's so it's awfully new rawl really indeed i had said in what way is it particularly pardon me up to date oh she replied it is so real rollo then reassuringly they don't talk about the soul you know you needn't be afraid of that it's it's instinct the soul is quite too old you know a full season behind i assented gravely and so the soul she mrs vicars is superseded in favour of the dilettante animal is that so my sister yes she agreed doubtfully and added of course there are outsiders it turned out as caroline had said to be instinct primal sanity and the elemental paganism and very prettily put i heard it no one was blasé they said so they were enthusiastic 
my young man declared it with an animation that brought him near to spilling the liqueur carefully poised on his knee he spoke of the keen joy of living delicately and epigrammatically digressing to observe that he preferred indian cigarettes to brazilian and added that after all there was nothing like the great rough kindnesses of the mother earth cicely vicars gathering was indisputably in the vanguard of the latest cry mr eleanor mccoyd seemed to take to me for he spoke almost immediately of a people who understand i was evidently admitted on sight to the mystery and improved the occasion accordingly i examined my finger-nails i had seen him do so and dropped my pearls of wisdom nonchalantly as not expecting they would be gathered up he was talking softly and almost sleepily on the picturesqueness of mass and brute bulk there is something quite titanic he said in the conception of a world where nothing was as yet ruled and squared out for us where everything was vague and shifting it is an especially gigantic thought i replied appreciatively the insistence nowadays of the social nexus i paused and he nodded comprehendingly at the cue yes he replied that also is true and if it were only possible to escape from the bewildering system into the clean fields and the rain-washed heather to evade the ever-present self and to take refuge in the great unhewn passions i queried gently exactly he replied again carefully contemplating his nails to know again the crude and volcanic life everything is tertiary in these days we have no primaries nothing rude or red i forbore to challenge the remark as to rudeness and agreed that from my observation it hardly appeared to be an age of epics he approved passing his hand over his sleek clean hair and yet he continued judicially weighing each word and turning to the nails of the other hand and yet why why should we the heirs of the centuries be in reality the slaves of them why should we not love for instance as the rugged forgotten ones loved why should we love through the post-office and by chaperonage through engagements and marriages why should we not he forbore to say what and sighed apparently for the days when he might have loved with a stone axe in untracked forests and through rivers in flood i offered him a cigarette he lighted it and gazed before him as though he were culling a nascent thought from the smoke and went on slowly and prophetically nevertheless he said more softly than ever the strong man shall come and when he shall appear the man for whom we are waiting the man who shall break the bonds and go back back it was a characteristic of most of his sentences that he finished them by watching the films of smoke before him this time he made a remarkably perfect smoke ring i thought of caroline and wondered what she was doing in such a milieu i was fain to speak and what form of creative expression do you adopt mr mccoyd i asked gracefully he replied with a modest diffidence the drama one is but a mouthpiece a medium yet the speech from living lips with the living person before the eyes oh you are doubtless right i replied words are unconvincing things must be seen to be believed he noticed nothing and proceeded to speak of the modern french chansonnette now caroline i remembered had before her engagement accounted for a large portion of her time in putting together the materials for a comedy which however she had since discontinued under the somewhat exclusive demands of courtship i had never been privileged to see the work in question but understood that a naughty proposal scene had coincidentally been abandoned precisely at the time that she could had she wished have given it an autobiographical interest bassishaw's love besides interrupting the course of art bade fair to cut it off altogether just when it would have given the true note that the stage it is declared is aching for but even young authors have scruples in making their own affairs public and so caroline had willed it 
nevertheless it could do caroline no harm to meet mr eleanor mccoyd and mr mccoyd himself could do no less than accept resignedly the latter-day limitations of love in the presence of my sister after all mrs vicker's salon was for the interchange of ideas my sister i remarked is interested in the drama and has herself half realized aspirations in the way of comedy mr mccoyd would be charmed and i presented him i was called away for a few moments by mrs vicars by the time i returned mr mccoyd was talking his remarks being apparently directed to the point at which caroline's comedy had been relinquished it is difficult he observed with a polite interest to know what to do with one's young leads nowadays i suppose they must love the philistine still clings to the conventional love theme but it is all so stale in the old days it was different from the angle of caroline's chin i saw that it was anything but stale to her and that the remark was unfortunate she was evidently of opinion that the subject of love however much used had had anything but adequate treatment and that in one or two important respects she was in a position to direct a new light on the literary treatment of it what do you mean mr mccoyd she asked merely he replied casually that there is so little dash and high-handedness about our modern methods of love-making you get your couples together and they talk in the same weary way the same old flat talk 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 i smiled at the description as applied to bashisaw whose fluency was not remarkable and caroline looked coldly before her you refer to the stage mr mccoyd she asked i refer to modern love-making he replied rashly we have no romantic methods left it has become a business and a bore when we do get it out it's one kiss and thank heaven it's over caroline looked emphatic contradiction i interposed the roman soldiery it is related i said being once in want of wives caroline interrupted me quickly i think mr mccoyd she returned that people love just as passionately nowadays as they ever did he might have seen what was the matter but he was on his own subject and went blindly at it true he replied true but the surroundings the circumstances the littleness of everyday life they crush it out we love by rule and etiquette at social functions and at gaslit drawing-rooms i looked at caroline for a confirmation of bashishaw's methods but the personal equation was too much for her contemplation of the artistic side of the question of course we do mr mccoyd she returned waving it seemed to me the part that had to do with the gas what else can we do eleanor mccoyd raised his eyebrows and shoulders in a deferential gesture that was supposed to explain the way the wind still blows he said the rain the open air the parks i suggested are already but he continued we wear frock coats and carry umbrellas we marry and our children resume the same hopeless round there is no romance no poetry no heroism in it we become engaged for a certain period to please our friends and marry out of consideration for one another we have no impulse no real instinct we have no no militant love he seemed to receive a fresh start from the last phrase and alas ruined himself irretrievably why he exclaimed even those to whom we might look for a vigorous expression of it those who lead lives of adventurous excitement our soldiers and sailors are just as bad as you remarked mr butterfield the roman soldiers the social system might be attacked disintegrated and shown wanting in the eyes of amateur modern paganism the spirit of the age might be arraigned and condemned by twenty juries of the advanced salons modish culture might stalk hock deep in the wreckage of civilization but to caroline the prestige of the army was vested in the person of bassishaw bassishaw's mode of love-making had been compared to its disfavour with the practices of roman legions 
she raised her head disdainfully without glancing at the unconscious mr eleanor mccoyd spoke half over her shoulder and condemned a great nation in bassishaw's defence i don't think very highly mr mccoyd of the romans i think that when they that on that occasion at least they were horrid and unnecessarily rough and that nice people would never have done it it may make good pictures but one would rather be a pleasant person than an unpleasant picture and i don't care a bit what anybody says soldiers are just as good as anybody else and better beyond comparison better her shoulders seemed to say as she turned away mccoyd shifted his other elbow to the piano and then looked at me i am afraid mr butterfield that i have not been able to help your sister much in the play after all the real impulse must come from within it is i replied a pleasing reticence when the real impulse stays there the self-sacrifice imposed by art is not necessarily a sacrifice of one's self very true he answered approvingly and took coffee end of episode twelve episode thirteen of the complete bachelor by oliver onions this librivox recording is in the public domain episode thirteen pot luck do you know butterfield bassie shaw said i don't know how you get along that is get along you know as you do the remark didn't seem particularly illuminating but he had been silent for ten minutes and this appeared to be the result of his cogitation no i said encouragingly well you know what i mean he replied i mean how you manage in the way you do you know never to you've never hang it butterfield why don't you get married oh i answered i see of course i didn't quite catch the idea at first of course why don't i get married yes he replied much relieved you you should you know it's the finest thing in the world being engaged that is you've no idea really butterfield he seemed quite eager about it i put my feet comfortably on the fender and waited for him to expand he kept his eyes on the fire you know he went on slowly you'll feel awfully lonely and all that soon that is when caroline goes i mean matchmaking is never a man's line he draws back at the very intimate point he should press home arthur did his best mrs loring had probably been talking to him i shall miss her very much i replied very much indeed but to whom do you propose to marry me he seemed rather abashed and a trifle impatient don't be an ass he said i could not be certain owing to the firelight that he blushed but i chanced it i didn't object to these palpable attempts to marry me to millicent dixon but it was disparaging to my intelligence that i should be supposed not to notice them anyway the male element was a new feature in the alliance and do you think that she and i would be a well-matched pair i asked he professed a hypocritical ignorance as to what i meant i laughed mrs loring i answered can give you points arthur you would apparently marry me on general principles she particularizes we were waiting for caroline and millicent millicent and bassishaw were dining with us that evening and bassishaw had lately i knew been a good deal perturbed on my account more than once he had timidly suggested that a woman's hand in a place made all the difference you know and i had caught him glancing round my rooms with something of a disparaging valuation of their contents when he should take caroline away his friendly concern in itself was deserving of my gratitude but with this qualification that i don't believe he was above suspecting that i should take to drink in the imminent solitude of my bereft apartments i was extracting from him the fervent declaration that i couldn't imagine how splendid it being engaged made you feel and that to know that there was one upon whom etc etc forever when millicent and caroline entered we rose to greet them how do you do millicent i said i'm glad to see you 
heaven she replied let me come near the fire i'm as cold as a seminary breakfast how do you do arthur what a blessed blaze don't go away arthur bassishaw had gone over to the table where caroline was making the last unnecessary arrangements and was having his flower pinned on oh his circulation's all right i remarked we were once like that and millicent looking over her shoulder laughed at me and said the dear infants dinner was served and we took our places i faced caroline while millicent who was still chilly and didn't mind the fire at her back looked over the flowers at bassishaw an arrangement as can be diagrammatically proved offering facilities for between-deck pressing of feet on a diagonal plan and which appeared to suit my young sister admirably i gave her an amused glance which millicent intercepted and carrie tried unsuccessfully to look as if she hadn't done it never mind him carrie millicent said reassuringly he's an envious old man who's wasted his youth and he's getting cynical his failing years won't permit him to do such things himself and his conscience begins to hurt him this was the woman without whom on bassishaw's opinion my abode fell short of completeness my failing years miss dixon i returned bring with them a certain charity nevertheless allow me to point out your reason for condoning such practices which is she queried that you are quite capable of doing the same thing yourself she laughed and bassishaw looked puzzled oh i'm not tottering to my fall yet she retorted i have all sorts of little surprises in my blood you forbid reply miss dixon i answered you take refuge in a position where man can only maintain a respectful and incredulous silence a woman's years are she challenged and an income tax return i am beneath your roof mr butterfield she replied with the dignity of st james comedy caroline evidently disapproved strongly she caught my eye i don't think you're a bit nice this evening rollo she said if i were millicent she straightened her back i wouldn't dine with you don't take any notice of him milly dear perhaps i replied the disparity in years is too great think so bassishaw i looked round the flowers at him he seemed rather embarrassed and said nothing i filled millicent's glass and turned to her what do you think bassishaw was saying to me just before you came in i received a kick bassishaw behind the flowers was very red indeed heaven forbid that i should guess millicent replied men are frail creatures he was speaking i continued of women as a domestic institution no home he said was complete without one considered decoratively she gave an air of brightness bassishaw must have been as busy in his pedicpulations as an organist for caroline peremptorily held out her glass to be replenished i continued as a companion he said much could be forgiven her and she had admirable managing gifts millicent bowed across the flowers the sex thanks you arthur she said it is quite the proper point of view for a young man as for this belated bachelor myself he never did nor ever will think rightly on the subject bassishaw looked at me reproachfully i didn't mean what you think i meant he said uncomfortably forgive me you meant much more than i say i think you meant i meant i meant he replied and then apologetically well you are getting on you know and you've missed so much really rollo if you like being alone a man who's never you don't mind my saying it well he doesn't know that's all bassishaw subsided rather incoherently but applied himself to his plate with conviction i looked at millicent who glanced sidelong fun under her lids what you say is perfectly convincing as a proposition arthur she remarked the man who's never never does know but the application is another matter from report there were hopes for rollo butterfield that he had failed to justify he flirted notoriously 
thank you gracious lady i replied complacently leaning back at my ease that is the name the world gives it your conduct with dolly hemingway was shameless marriage would certainly have been an illogical conclusion i admitted and violet mellish told me herself dear little vi i approved her conversation never did lack the relish of revelation you must not suppose arthur that i have not had the normal past that my years would guarantee you appear to think so bassishaw didn't seem to see it at all he fumbled with his fork i expect you've had your fancies of course he replied but i don't mean just fancies that's only flirting the man who cannot flirt never sees that the power to do so is a gift of the gods arthur held by negative constancy flirtation i replied is not the simple affair you think arthur it is not necessarily a matter of twilights and conservatories and does not even always demand privacy for a flirtation with zest there is nothing like having an audience is that not so millicent spare me the revelation of my ignorance millicent returned moving her chair an inch or two from the now importunate fire and looking over her shoulder it is possible the only requisites are a woman a secret and as many spectators as have not the use of their eyes i continued those granted you may riot in innuendo and your reputation go scatheless it is the very button on the cap bassishaw could think of nothing more original to say than that it was playing with edged tools carry was directing the removal of plates i devoted my attention to millicent i had one very serious fancy though millicent i remarked shall i tell you i trust it is not unfit for the children she replied looking this time beneath the flowers at bassishaw the knowledge of good and evil from your point of view might not be of advantage to them caroline looked round curiously oh rollo what was that she said you never told me no i inquired incredulously and you my sister too ah well it was this summer mornings at seven i used to go across the fields with a bathing towel on my return i was generally met by i never mentioned her name it would be indiscreet said millicent discretion i answered is the better part of flirtation they were lovely mornings and there was a style a rather high style a distinct opportunity i looked carefully away from millicent and turned to bassishaw yes he said appreciatively and what happened i fancy i continued that she always met me on my side of the stile so that we always had to get over it bassishaw seemed to approve the strategy nice girl he asked she combined i replied the harmlessness of the dove with the wisdom of the serpent for she used to feel tired when we got there and rest there was just room for two caroline was interested and when was this rollo she asked my dear carrie i returned you had just begun german you were at school well this woman of mine would pull a flower to pieces or light a cigarette for me or some such foolishness she knew the exact distance at which her hair would touch my face if it were a little tumbled and so on millicent made the criticism that the least she could have done under the circumstances was to have sprained her ankle and who was it carrie asked eagerly the woman who presumed to condemn my carrying on with dolly hemingway and violet mellish sat smiling in frank innocence she whose ignorance of such matters was to be scrupulously respected sat with unconsciousness on her brow and gave graceful attention to my story she who had called me a belated bachelor who had spoken of my failing years and my perspective of hesitating singleness and above all whose memory needed no hint as to what i was going to say dissembled without a quiver who was it caroline repeated the name is the least essential part of the affair i replied we are concerned with the style yes the style millicent said what happened 
were she to ask me herself i should only whisper i returned she leaned back and laughed outright you are too considerate on her account to make the story very interesting she remarked i swear i could finish it better myself one day you tried to kiss her millicent had chosen the hazardous line of safety she had told the truth i stole a glance at her under the cover of the flowers i tried not to i replied and she was angry she did her best to be angry she was till the next morning i answered and then you begged her pardon i did nothing of the kind i was not so young as all that but at least you were sorry millicent suggested not from that day to this i replied it was too perfect millicent moved her chair a little further and as she did so it might have been done purposely you never can tell with millicent her foot touched mine gently and as it remained there a moment i felt more like bassishaw than i would have cared to admit she has since told me i don't mind saying that i have good eyes be that as it may the mischief in her own was for a second tempered to an expression that was nobody's business but mine i felt tempted to forswear my theory and to regret the presence of an audience she rose gaily this is all very well she said but it is a bad thing to have the fire at your back be good enough to put the screen up arthur arthur did so but the story caroline persisted impatiently she wanted to get to the reconciliation with tears how does the story go on it went on i replied in much the same way it is not quite finished yet she looked a virtuous reproof i am surprised rollo she said that you should have behaved in so indiscreet a fashion i think that on that occasion it was just as well there was nobody there i should be exceedingly sorry to witness any such proceeding it would make me extremely uncomfortable i laughed and stroked my little sister's hair what liqueur will you take millicent i asked End of episode thirteen Episode fourteen of the Complete Bachelor by Oliver Onions. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Episode fourteen The Things That Are Caesars. Almost the whole of my female acquaintance seemed to be gathered in my rooms, and seemed, moreover, to be doing its collective best to persuade me of the superfluity of my presence the occasion was the eve of caroline's wedding and the natural interest i myself took in the event paled before the engrossing fascination it appeared to have for these ladies the company consisted largely of mrs loring chatterton but she was ably supported by the remainder of her particular set and half a dozen supernumerary bridesmaids not one of whom with the exception perhaps of a quiet little creature who sat apart and said nothing but would willingly have turned me out of the house and home had she dared as a person who could perfectly well be dispensed with from the whispered conversations and secret conferences around me i was rigidly excluded which i regretted the more as i felt i should have taken a peculiar pleasure in them my good man said mrs loring striding over my feet with an armful of bridesmaids frippery what a lot of room you take up you are sure you have no engagement this evening nothing of importance mrs loring i replied looking up from an entry book of bridal gifts i was curiously scanning with mental notes of my own you may consider me entirely at your disposal my duty is here to-night of all nights and when you and mrs carmichael can spare caroline i also have certain advice to give her not inappropriate to the occasion don't you think you had better go and give arthur the benefit of your wisdom she rejoined alas i replied it is too late he cannot draw back now he must take the inevitable consequences of engagement he has made his bed i see no reason for your being indelicate mr butterfield answered mrs chatterton and she rustled away dignity in flounces <laughs> 
never had my flat known such wealth of plate and tissue paper had jupiter in wooing denae adopted a silver currency he could scarcely have crowded more lavishly the grecian tower ladies slipped in and out of the miscellaneous collection with feminine calculations and judgments which i noted in secret joy estimating apparently the whole affair in its comparison with previous functions and above all and more insistent from their very quietness were heard the mysterious confabulations i crossed over to mrs carmichael and caroline well little sister i said glancing at mrs carmichael and what unspeakable things has mrs kit been telling you now oh rollo she replied placing her hand pleadingly on my sleeve she hasn't please don't tease me to-night dear i am not a bit happy i almost wish i was not going to be married then she has i returned mrs kit how could you but there you're all alike they're not in the least interested in you carrie my dear it's just a wedding a woman and a bride's cake what do you know about it mrs carmichael said disdainfully madam i replied the exultation of your sex in all that pertains to a wedding is barely fit for the contemplation of a bachelor cannot you disguise your interest in some seemly manner if you'll arrange these cards she retorted instead of concerning yourself with things of no moment to you you'll be of much more service will you be so good as to label these presents and with as little talk as is convenient to you this to me mind in my own house i looked to caroline to espouse my cause and to resent the outrage on my feelings but she merely looked plaintively with a sigh which mrs kit called after me qualified as a dupoy i tried mrs vickers who was fluttering round the other end of the glittering table arranging the nuptial tribute in symphonic harmonies of the kensington amateur order mrs vickers is aesthetic at a streak's length and as millicent dixon had once spitefully said wears her art upon her sleeves for jays to laugh at she was placing her own offering something in plush and oil colour modestly shrinkingly all but out of sight i was saying something about the spiritual reality of which all this external show was but the outward symbol when she cut me off oh mr butterfield she said why did cissy bingham give caroline a green fan possibly mrs vickers i replied for the same order of reason that causes a miller to wear a white hat but a green one how horrid look at her complexion and she bent the trifle coquettishly round her chin with a well-studied sparkle over the top of it a lesson in feminine arts and crafts a fan mrs vickers i replied may be used either for flirtation or concealment before marriage afterwards only for the latter in either case the appropriateness i think you are very horrid mr butterfield she answered preening the open-work effervescence of her corsage and turning her shoulders to me in pique i believe mrs bassishaw wants you i tried my luck with mrs bassishaw arthur's mother mrs bassishaw is a comely widow as young as is compatible with having a son on the eve of marriage and still possessing what her friends call excellent chances she made a place for me by her side you and i will be less in the way in this corner mr butterfield she said and we can watch the young people doesn't this make you feel terribly old i declare i feel myself aging already she passed her hand over her glossy hair i also feel it keenly mrs bassishaw i replied and only think mr butterfield she continued should should you become an uncle i shall be a grandmother oh i do hope they'll be comfortable and happy i have not a doubt mrs bassishaw i answered that they will be exceedingly comfortable and becomingly happy only that she inquired is not that a good deal i replied they are i believe made for each other but i do not expect anything epic from either of them 
nor will they so far as i can see mark the beginning of an aeon in the annals of matrimony you are very hard on them mr butterfield poor things she answered apparently because i had not granted them the beginning of an aeon thus does one suffer for principle i rose to interview an automatic reporter from a fashion paper whom mrs loring handed over to me with a request to be good enough to take the thing seriously i told him that the presents were numerous and costly including here followed a list and crossed over to a knot of frolicking bridesmaids that was gabbling millinery in one corner these young ladies had apparently a good deal to say and prominent among the chatter could be heard miss nelly bassishaw's voice declaring that something or other of hers was of a poorer quality of silk than some one else's which was always the way she remarked with a grown-up toss of the head when one bought six gowns at the same shop miss flo bassishaw and another maid were talking simultaneously the one saying that the organist was sure to play the march too soulfully for it to be of much use as walking music and the other that old blank a respected friend of mine could afford to give cheap salad bowls now that he had married all his daughters and above all and to an extent that was an enlightenment even to me the pairing arrangements for the breakfast were discussed with a freedom and pointedness that took entire precedence of any other significance the occasion might have in this theme again miss nelly revelled i don't care she said i shall ask carrie he's not a bit too old and i have met him before you haven't i'm not going to be bored to death by jack summers and have to do all the talking myself and that's my decision she said irrevocably we shall have our hair up by to-morrow too returned flo with the spiteful familiarity of a younger sister and i shall hear every word you say because i shall be on the other side i don't know why they ask such a crowd another half-blown bud of sixteen joined in i expect rollo butterfield went to school with most of them they're old enough and fat enough and dull enough and bald enough the poise of her chin seemed to say i admired her confidence and what about blank a nod of miss nelly's head gave the direction to my eyes i looked and saw apparently unheeded by the noisy group the pretty timid creature i had remarked once or twice before an imported cousin of somebody's condemned to wear pink because it suited the rest she was out in the cold but something in the abstracted quietness of her pose told me it was perhaps as much from choice as from the passing over of her companions oh miss flo replied she can go somewhere near rollo butterfield she'll be less awkward near him than with anybody else and then jack summers seeing myself so allotted i thought it well to make the acquaintance beforehand of the maid for whose conversational flow i was to be responsible i skirted the group and sat down by her i see you're taking a short rest from your duties aggie i remarked are you having a good time yes thank you mr butterfield she answered shyly i think it's all lovely the dresses and things i asked no she replied turning gray eyes upon me mr bassishaw and the wedding and caroline the presents don't matter much do they mr butterfield i looked around in some doubt i don't know aggie i returned every one appears to think a good deal of that sort of thing except you and me i think we shall be friends aggie thank you mr butterfield the gray eyes looked into some middle distance that i could not follow caroline does look nice she added making an admission that for some reason did not seem easy to her but of course she's your sister and brothers do not think of that young brothers i mean your brothers are young then aggie yes and they say no one will ever want to marry me but that is when i won't be tied to a table for them to fight about an imprisoned princess you know it doesn't matter now she added half to herself and apparently forgetful of my presence and you don't like all this 
i inquired designating the surrounding bustle with my hand no she replied in the same half musing tone we shouldn't have wanted bridesmaids and things you know of course she momentarily remembered my position it's all lovely but we should just have gone away somewhere and not have had anybody but perhaps a maid we shouldn't have wanted any one else you know and we should have lived there ever so long that would have been nice she was scarcely talking to me but i replied it is the ideal wedding aggie although it is only for the few there are relations and people i trust you will make a success of it i hope you will allow me to make you a present though she raised her head again with the same remote look i noticed a fine gold chain around her neck the end of which disappeared in her bosom it won't ever be quite the same she replied perhaps some day i shall have forgotten i looked at the chain and spoke quietly is that yes she replied her hand going softly to her breast i cut it out of a group but he didn't give it to me you don't mind if i don't show it to you do you mr butterfield you don't know what it is to lose anybody like that you forget i am losing a sister aggie i answered she thought a moment and then made a sudden resolve she spoke softly and almost mechanically i think i will tell you mr butterfield i wouldn't tell she looked around any one else but i trust you mr butterfield i haven't given caroline my present yet i haven't made up my mind i've got two a handkerchief case and this i could give her the handkerchief case anybody can give handkerchief cases or the other anybody wouldn't give the other i can't keep it mr butterfield look she glanced round and drew the small locket from her neck and opened it it was bassie shaw's portrait a poor ragged production cut out as she had said from some larger picture i half glanced at it understanding without looking it is worth more than a handkerchief case she continued speaking very low and i know caroline would value it more if i told her if any one did that to me i should i should love them wouldn't you mr butterfield i made no reply poor aggie she was only sixteen and would get over it but it was real to her and she was very brave she went on and that's why i don't like all these things mr butterfield what would you do mrs carmichael was signalling for me across the room i rose and took aggie's hand my dear i replied you have a truer instinct in these things than i whatever you do will be right i know and a fat blundering man would spoil it we sit together at breakfast to-morrow i'm very glad and in response to mrs carmichael's imperious summons i left her and plunged again into the general bewilderment shortly afterwards i heard mrs vicker's voice oh look caroline what a sweet handkerchief case agnes there has given you End of episode fourteen episode fifteen of the complete bachelor by oliver onions this librivox recording is in the public domain episode fifteen settling day caroline was married and with a decent tear had left for a month's sweet lunacy under blue skies and on the mediterranean terraces i had bestowed an appropriate valediction at victoria station to the accompanying exhalation of steam the slamming of doors and the waving of a green flag and had returned to my flat it had not appeared quite the same to me i had peeped into the little room that had been so long her own and a sense of emptiness and unfamiliarity had struck me leaving little desire to make friends with it my own rooms were structurally unchanged but a corded and labelled trunk left to be called for after the bridal trip seemed to occupy the whole place to my utter exclusion and unsettled me greatly i perceived that virtue had gone out from these lifeless shells of apartments and my feline attachment to the building itself was not sufficiently strong to reconcile me to an immediate resumption of the old order of things 
on the whole i did not waste much sentiment over the matter but spoke a word to mrs loring's ear received an invitation from some friends of hers in the country left my chairs in canvas and my blinds in full mourning and made haste to lawns and trim clipped hedges till i should summon resolution to face the fresh conditions this gave mrs loring a certain opportunity which as i had foreseen she was little likely to waive and which also suited my mood admirably overhead the rooks were holding their sage sustained conference and i i believe nodding gravely and judicially when an undefined sense of intruding mortals caused me to blink through my lashes mrs loring and millicent were slowly crossing the lawn in my direction their white gowns dipping from orange to grey and grey to orange as they traversed the belts of light mrs loring was talking this be it said was mrs loring's supreme opportunity i had no wish to listen it was forced on my passive ears i suppose she was saying now that caroline's gone he must i know that cicely vickers told me you can do what you like with a man who feels a little bit sorry for himself millicent she did this seemed somehow to concern me i had doubtless felt somewhat low but had no idea i had showed it so plainly as that anyway cicely vickers doubtless knew millicent replied i don't think it's fair molly to talk like that rollo butterfield isn't a fool and i dare say charlie vickers isn't such a fool as he was then thank you dear lady he isn't a fool mrs loring replied but i do call it criminal simply criminal that a man who is getting older and fatter every week should keep putting off and putting off for no reason at all except that he's ashamed to give in after so long it's rank breach of promise i know rollo butterfield these were hard words to hear of oneself apparently mrs loring's one desire was that that presence of mine fat hang her impudence should hold decently together through a marriage service and run to seedy corpulence immediately afterwards for all she cared but millicent vindicated me nobly if rollo butterfield molly was prepared to marry me to keep me in countenance with all the people we know i'd never let him propose to me which he hasn't done by the way but you don't understand him a little bit he's not much fatter my dear saving your presence than loring and anyway he'll be a young man when loring's uh, you understand me and you can't say very much more to me on the subject molly you'll have to propose to him yourself then milly said mrs loring with a worldly shrug i should not be afraid to do that millicent retorted defiantly i should like to be there when it happened mrs loring's tone expressed the most off-hand incredulity at the affair being ever definitely settled there was a silence as they approached and discovered my presence now i had never been in the least resentful of mrs loring chatterton's self-arrogated responsibility for my welfare and millicent's it had always been too open and frank to be regarded as interference but in that moment she had given me a hint that i felt half inclined to act upon suppose she really were there when it happened i rose to meet them welcome dear ladies i said you almost caught me napping i believe i have been dreaming and seemed to hear voices i looked at millicent and thought she understood but it did not occur to mrs loring that i might have overheard you dream a good deal nowadays mr butterfield don't you she said somewhat assiduously i fear mrs loring i replied that i have lately done it to an extent that is almost criminal she was still unenlightened but i saw that millicent guessed i made places for them on either side of me but mrs loring hesitated standing no chance is too trivial for a matchmaker sit down mrs loring i said making myself comfortable just out of the sun she sat down i continued i have been watching the sunset here all alone it is a lovely evening you and loring have doubtless been sitting hand in hand waiting for the twilight no 
the surroundings seemed to call for that kind of thing somehow don't you think i'm glad to hear you say so mr butterfield i have hopes of you even yet the evening certainly inspires such such things providing they are strictly en regle most decidedly i assented that must always be understood i admit that it is a delicate matter that there are times when even the most permissible caress becomes unseasonable just as at others an unseasonable one is almost permissible but as a general rule such proceedings must be as you say strictly en regle i find you in a most reasonable mood this evening mr butterfield she approved with a glance at millicent dreaming evidently does you good pray continue i acknowledged her encouragement and went on it must be taken for granted first of all that the endearments is a bondi fide guarantee in which case publicity is not only unnecessary but impertinent a third person for instance could not possibly take the slightest interest in it it would be highly unbecoming she assented quite so i replied half absently and that is where the kindly interest of say the married chaperon fails in the moment that her presence becomes most necessary it becomes superfluous is not that so if you mean mr butterfield that i she said making a movement as if to rise my dear mrs loring i replied we are discussing a perfectly abstract question you appear to be able to deal only with a concrete case then she retorted the sunset has done you less good than i thought an abstract case on an evening like this and her eyes appeared to fill with pity for millicent that lady looked up but said nothing it is on such evenings mrs loring i returned that nothing but the presence of the chaperon divides the abstract from the concrete then you do mean she said almost impetuously does it occur to you mrs loring i replied that you are speaking with remarkable freedom mrs loring was in a difficult position to stay was to nullify the opportunity and to postpone indefinitely so she thought the consummation of her disinterested endeavours to leave on the other hand was a hint so pointed that even she felt it might give rise to an embarrassment that would defeat its own ends i pointed this out to her of course in an entirely abstract way and millicent i was pleased to see regarded the comedy with an amused coolness that had in it very little sympathy for mrs loring chatterton and her methods she looked up laughing it would be rather a difficult position for any chaperon to be placed in she said mischievously wouldn't it molly molly was rather at a loss a chaperon's is a difficult position altogether milly she said and it means considerable self-sacrifice on the part of the one who undertakes it it is a thankless office i replied but in the case of impetuous youth i suppose it is necessary hot blood mrs loring must be watched she was getting puzzled and evidently losing her hold on the situation after all she answered doubtfully when one has confidence in people perhaps it doesn't matter so much it is dangerous i warned her when young recklessness takes the bit between its teeth and plunges headlong into a course of matrimony millicent smiled at the description as applied to ourselves some calmer ruling is almost essential personally i think that at all proposals an appointed authority should conduct the ceremonies one cannot manage such affairs alone she didn't quite catch the suggestion it is perfectly unnecessary she replied indeed i asked and suppose the affair hung fire and the proposal never came at all imagine the sorrow of the goddess outside the machine i almost think she has a right to insist on personal supervision i think you are talking a great deal of nonsense she replied then mrs loring you fail to follow me take a case say in which the woman proposes i suppose you will admit the possibility the man might be a fool or delatory or getting fat mrs loring chatterton suddenly turned on me looked me up down widthways and through 
and found no speech i returned her look and millicent broke into unrestrained laughter the light that came to the goddess outside the machine was too much for her coherence rollo butterfield and you too millicent dixon millicent mr butterfield how dare you sir you listened i didn't say it you didn't say what mrs loring i asked oh don't take the trouble to feign innocence i always thought mr butterfield i never stop laughing millicent this is not a farce i didn't think mr butterfield that you would use at least anything you heard in so discreditable a manner mrs loring i answered i did not listen i was dreaming dreaming does me good and i heard the rooks calling and several other things quite against my will besides i added if you will consider a moment don't you think i was too deeply concerned in your friendly aspersions not to have some kind of right in them i wish to put the thing euphoniously you understand mrs loring but haven't you interested yourself too long in what concerns me first of all to take up any position of outraged propriety now i awaited her reply my eyes on her face i should have been sorry to fall out with mrs loring i had had too much amusement out of her to take her too seriously and i recognized that meddling was too harsh a word for her conduct for a full minute she sat looking straight in front of her and then smiled all was well i'm sorry for you millicent she said for the first time i have doubts as to your happiness with this creature i may yet have to repent that ever i gathered you both under my wing rollo butterfield you think i'm laughing but i'm not i haven't forgiven you you reserve your forgiveness mrs loring till no further evasion is possible you are still permit me to remind you premature i looked at millicent whose face expressed the greatest relish for the whole scene millicent understood and cared as little for mrs loring's presence as i did myself a new recklessness took possession of me so long as she knew i didn't give a schoolgirl's kiss what happened mrs loring was making uneasy motions and had attempted several false starts with the object of leaving us alone i took millicent's hand imprisoned it in both my own and looked squarely at mrs loring she sat spellbound fascinated a wedding guest who could not choose but hear millicent i said and paused rollo she replied mrs loring made another attempt to break away sit in the middle mrs loring i said and we made the rearrangement i turned again to millicent mrs loring says you are to propose to me millicent mrs loring says you would be ashamed to give in after so long rollo you are afraid millicent that i shall say it sudden i am not afraid of anything that you will say or do she added as i took her hands across miss loring then i replied i have the honour to ask you miss dixon this was too much for mrs loring she burst through our hands and stood trembling staring lost hysterical then fled when the moon a timid debutante in a faint sky rose behind the clipped box hedge we were still in the arbour millicent and i one of her hands shone with an unaccustomed jewel it had been my mother's ring and her other was in my personal and private keeping i believe rollo she said that you are still little more than a boy millicent i replied i realize less now than ever the prospect of being grown up i am merely grown out though scarcely more so than loring i added she laughed at the recollection and you didn't mind proposing to me i said i shouldn't have minded proposing to you rollo had you not did i propose to you then millicent i'm sure i don't know she replied perhaps molly had her wish after all anyway it didn't make much difference end of episode fifteen end of the complete bachelor by oliver onions